target gets split into its component. Like for example, rain droplets do after a thunderstorm and you see a rainbow. So why spectra are important? Because spectra tell astronomer what the object is made of. Images tell us how objects look like, but we really want to know the physical, chemical composition, the elements that are there, and for that we need spectra. And because web will be so powerful, 100 times more powerful than web, we do believe that we'll be able to take spectra of all these faint objects that we see at the edge of our observable universe. We are ready to continue with the research. It's absolutely incredible. For those of you that might not be familiar with the Hubble Deep Field, which was the image that we had started with there, when Antonella says the size of a pencil, it's looking down the narrow part of the pencil, that tiny little bit of the sky. Anywhere you look in the sky, there are many thousands of galaxies very, very far away from us. So um, again, and, and for, for our viewers, you know, we, we often get a lot of questions about how is it that we're able to look back in time? A lot of people, I've actually gotten questions on social media recently about what direction do you need to look to see that far back in time? Maybe you could give us just a little bit of an astronomy lesson about how, how is it that we can view the early universe? Yes, you look anywhere because wherever you look, your eyesight basically looks as far as you can go. And the farthest you go, you go, the farthest you go back in time. So as I was saying, these very faint galaxies that we see in the Hubble Deep Field have traveled for th the light for those galaxies has traveled for 13.2 billion years. So we see them today as they were 13 billion years ago. And this is the powerful of this amazing telescope who can actually look at the beginning of the formation of the universe. Because one of the things that uh, Webb will do, you know, it will be focusing on origins. What is the origin of our universe? As well as other origin things like how stars form, what's the origin of stars? So you can see that Webb is going to look, we hope, in the up to the first 100 or 200 million years after the Big Bang. If we're really lucky, we might even see the first star. Thomas was talking about first star earlier on. That's a challenge, but this is one maybe of the surprises that the web will bring us together with many others, I'm sure. You know, I've also gotten questions about who gets to use web. You know, I mean, how, how is it, you know, one of the questions that I actually got on social media is, you know, do only people from NASA get to use web? And that's that's very much not the case. Uh, you, you, you work at the Space Telescope Science Institute where a lot of this happens. Give us a sense. How, how is time on web allocated? Absolutely. So the entire worldwide community can, can use web to observe. They just need to have a good idea and a laptop and an internet connection and they can submit their proposal and their proposal they will say i want to use these instruments to make this amazing discovery will be evaluated by a group of peers experts in the various fields and if that um, idea is compelling that idea will be scheduled on the telescope and as we speak we have already a first year already scheduled of observations that have been given out to the community, to the instrument builders who have the right to get the fruit of her hard work over so many years, and the early uh -huh. release science, uh, uh, scientists uh, who are actually... And OC, um, definitely it's ready to begin with a three-door latch to 200, move 9 of 20. And yeah, the there's a group of scientists... And you're going to continue. Hope you go to continue. This is so exciting to hear this <laughs> and to hear, you know, what's going on in the vault at the same time, which is one floor below. And kudos to the team for, for doing such an amazing, amazing work. You know, for astronomers, this is the biggest gift that we can get and uh, we're just looking forward to see what will work with us. But I was saying the early release science, uh, this is something that the director of STSCI used some of his precious directory discretionary hours to actually tell the community, submit proposals for approximately a couple of hundred hours, and they will be evaluated with this caveat. They will be done right away. 
the observation will become public. They will go in the archive. They will be made available to all because this observation will show the capability of this very powerful observatory. So there are a number of programs, some of which Europeans that are going to execute in the very, very first few months. And those are the ones that will show the, the world how actually um, uh, web performs. Uh, before that, we will have the early release observations. And those are really the ones that I'm waiting for to see. This is super secret list of targets. I don't know, you know what, what targets will be, but I know one thing that they will be absolutely spectacular and uh, they will be uh, shown to the world 200 days after launch at the end of the uh, commissioning, instrument commissioning. But uh, I hold your breath because it will, they will be just phenomenal. So we've talked a bit about the early universe, and I know that another you know, primary science goal of Webb has to do with exoplanets. And we mentioned that a little bit with Thomas, but I think maybe you could take us a bit more through uh, how does Webb actually analyze the, uh, the atmospheres of planets around other stars? Absolutely. So this is a technique that Hubble had already pioneered. And I want just to, to um, tell the community who is listening, you know, when Hubble was launched, we didn't know exoplanets. Now uh, we know that every star has exoplanets around. So this technique allows to study the atmosphere of the exoplanet as they move in front of their host stars. And by doing that, we can see but via spectroscopy, what actually the components of that atmosphere. And so you can see here the planet basically moving in front of the star, the light dipped, and the, in the infrared, we can see uh, important uh, component elements that are the building block, we believe, of life in the future. So water vapor, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen, all the complex molecules based on oxygen. Why we're looking for these molecules? Because the ultimate goal is to see if there is life out there. So we start looking at the building blocks. And the Hubble has already moved the field forward, but it's a small telescope. We do believe that being a hundred times more sensitive, Webb will just revolutionize this field. So our knowledge of exoplanet composition will be just spectacular. And maybe we will find another Earth out there. That's the big, you know, uh, award for, for this work. Stand by for Absolutely wonderful. Antonella, thank you so much for joining us. I hope the, uh, the day continues to be joyful and exciting. And, uh, and after this, we all get a bit of a break. So thank you again for joining us. That's, uh, that's Dr. Antonella Nota, the, uh, the, Europeans, uh, the European Space Agency representative here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Good luck to all. Thank you. See those parameters are good. You're good to continue with the motor mix. So the next uh, person we're going to be talking to is uh, is Joe uh, Spofera, and uh, he will tell us a little bit more about some of the engineering aspects of the Webb Telescope. For those of you that are just joining us, you're looking at live commissioning of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, I'm here at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm Michelle Thaller. And uh, Joe, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, so yeah. to, to begin with, please, please introduce yourself and, and, and tell us a bit about your role on the Webb Telescope. Uh, yeah, so uh, you mentioned my name's Joe Sperfera, so I've um, been working on the Webb Telescope for 16 and a half years now with Northrop Grumman. Uh, currently the program dynamics lead uh, for Northrop as well as doing uh, a lot of lead responsibilities for deployments with the team that we have, uh, both what we've done on the ground and what we're doing today here at the MOC for On Orbit. And how's, how's the morning gone for you? Are, you? are you as excited as everybody else and happy that things have gone well? Yeah, it's it's been going fantastic. It really has for the last two weeks as well. Kind of everything we could have hoped for uh, with all the operations have really gone quite nominal and quite to our expectations. So it's been a great commissioning so far. So uh, I guess uh, one of the things that we have that we can show our audience are some uh, footage from the tests that came uh, before the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, different tests in the clean room. So uh, I believe we're going to roll some video and you can tell me what we're seeing here, please, Joe. 
Yeah, so this is uh, actually the wing we're deploying today. So that was the ground deployment test for that wing the, the last time through. Uh, and actually, if we end up deploying both when deployed, this is our, our pre-observatory environment deployment. It was the last time that both wings were deployed at the same time on the ground. Uh, so you can kind of see the, the operations that went through there with all of the individuals in the high bay performing their jobs getting through. So um, down on the left there watching that wing deployment, uh, that's Paul Reynolds who's downstairs right now uh, as the dep lead doing the deployment, kind of watching for what's going on both like he would have on the floor there doing, uh, observing the deployment, looking to see any interactions, seeing what's happening. And uh, he's down there right now today with the rest of the mock team doing that deployment, watching for the telemetry to make sure we see what we want to see during the operation. And actually in this footage, you can see that there's sort of this this, this black border uh, on the outside of the mirror. And, and that, that's for a very specific purpose. Maybe you could tell us a bit about that. Uh, if you're speaking about the black border on the very outsides of all the mirrors, yes, yes that's, that's, right. yeah. that's there for uh, the, the frill section that goes around the outside, the fixed frill outside of the, the mirrors themselves for uh, thermal purposes so that you kind of have this deep black right next to the mirrors that would uh, not pick up the reflections of, that the mirrors actually And then of course uh, those beautiful that beautiful gold coating and uh, that that's something that uh, we get a lot of questions about as to why why the mirrors are, are, are coated with gold uh, can, can Give us a, an explanation for that, please <laughs> Uh, I'm probably not the best person to give you the explanation yeah. for that one, but that is the, the best material that was determined by yeah. you know, a number of scientists and engineers to, to give us the best performance for the optics and for taking data. When you see the deployment and the tests that were done, the thing that amazes me is that all this was done here on Earth. You know, there was no way to take this up into space and test it in space. And of course, in space, you don't have the influence of gravity, whereas here on Earth, you do. How do you design a test that you know that it, it, it's going to work in, in zero gravity. You know, how do you design to take that into account when you're testing here on Earth? Right, so the, the key thing there is uh, we have to have a very good understanding of the loads that we want to see in the deployment and the loads that we want to kind of counteract or counterbalance in the gravity field. Okay, cool. So we do want to try to maintain the, the resistances that we're trying to characterize or understand. So there are certain harnessing or insulation that provides a drag or resistance to the deployment. We still want to capture that in the test. Can you hear me now? Do I have sound now? I hope I have sound now. Now people say they can hear me. Hi everybody and welcome to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friend the neighborhood astronomer and all that jazz. And you know what? I just can't believe that we are live and celebrating a completely unfolded and all the way opened up and ready to keep going James Webb Space Telescope. It is a festivus for all of us and i'm so glad you joined us today uh we have uh as you can see we were basically simulcasting nasa's live feed uh just to kind of help you know get us into things don't really know exactly when nasa's going to be concluded because they're waiting just as we are for the observatories wing uh mirror wings to latch into place they've already been opened up and folded out but now we're just waiting for that to latch into place and that's key because if without it being latched it will quickly fall out and it'd be and that would be bad right so we don't want that to happen anyway if you are uh watching from somewhere uh let us know where you're watching from i want to know where you're checking in from and do feel free to uh tweet this out and share this with a friend 
Okay, so I'm hearing that my uh, volume is really high. That's probably because I am really uh, excited. Uh, but I'll go ahead and uh, cut my volume back. I hope that's a little bit better. Maybe that's a little bit better. Is that a little bit better? Okay, we got, oh my gosh, we got a lot of folks here checking in. Let's see, where are we all from? Oh my goodness, we've got folks from, we've got Toronto, Spain, Sao Paulo, Brazil, UK, Park City, Kansas. This is great. You know what? Let's just jump right into it. We're going to bring on uh, some guests here that we've already got uh, joining us today. Uh, because while we are waiting for the call outs from NASA, and I'm going to be flipping back and forth frantically behind the screen behind the behind the scenes trying to get this thing to work i'm going to uh introduce now uh, a couple of guests uh first of all we have uh we have dr uh, aaron young uh who's a postdoctoral fellow at uh, nasa's goddard space flight center and also joining us is bert pasquale who is a optical engineer at nasa's goddard space flight center so we've got some real expertise who are going to be telling us uh, about how Webb works and what we're going to be doing with James Webb. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, I think I have you muted. I'm sorry. How about now? Try it now. I think you have to unmute yourselves. Yeah, you do have to unmute yourselves because you're like totally... All right, I'm going to try it again. It says, we'll unmute. Um... All right, guys, I don't know what's going on here. We're having a little bit of a technical hiccup here. Let me see if I can't get these two guys. Uh, so let's see, it's showing you as being muted on sound levels. And I don't know what's going on. This was working just a moment ago. Uh, okay, it's all right. We're just going to figure it out. Okay, and get this going on. Yeah, I know. I know you guys did not check in to watch me fiddle around with uh so you can hear me loud and clear but you can't hear my guests and that's the problem they're muted they're just sitting there being kind of like uh-huh and i think this is what i get for uh for trying and i actually have a, a fourth guest i'm trying to bring in let's see if i can bring in my fourth guest here uh we also have dr patty boyd who is uh not there oh i'm so sorry patty i'll I'll cut away, let Patty get in, get in a position. Hmm. I really do wish I could understand why this is. All right, let me, let me do some stuff here, guys. Hi, Christian. I'm here, Heidi. Testing one, two, three. Loud and clear.
Patty, could you slide over, uh, please? Uh, just uh, a little bit more so we can get you into the shot. Uh, this direction. Uh, yeah, to your left. There okay. you go. Looks great. All right. It's all just going so perfectly well. <laughs> As it always does. I mean, if the live stream is the biggest technical glitch we have today, what a great outcome. I, I know, exactly. I, I agree with you 100%. Everybody, we are... Let me go ahead and publish that. Okay, we are back live with you, everybody. I'm so sorry. I hope you guys can see and hear all of us now. Uh, and if not, I don't know what to do. But you know what? I think as Patty just alluded to, if I'm screwing it up, then that's good. If they're screwing it up, that's bad. And they're not screwing anything up today. So leave it to me to screw things up. I hope I can get you guys a, a great show today. So we are obviously live, and this is kind of meta because we're, si we're, we're live streaming a live stream right now. And that's just because we didn't really know exactly when they would be finished today. Uh, they are, you know, we, the, the, as you could see from the uh, telemetry that the, uh, that the starboard mirror wing has now fully extended and fully uh, swung into place. What we were waiting on, if I understand it right, is that we're waiting on confirmation that everything has been latched into place. Why would latching something into place be a pretty good idea? Well, to help me understand that, I've got some wonderful guests here. I've got uh, uh, Dr. Aaron Young, uh, who's directly beneath me, who's a po postdoctoral research fellow at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and an expert on galaxies. Below Aaron, I've got Bert Pascal, who is an optical systems engineer. The guy builds telescopes for a living. In fact, he builds space telescopes for a living. At, also at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And then beneath Bert, we have Dr. Patty, Patty Boyd, who is a expert on all things astrophysics and particularly all things exoplanets. Welcome, my friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Happy New Year. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> so, um, I've got what I think is I've got the live stream muted here uh, because there's just uh, I got voices in my head coming from the live stream. So I'm listening in real time so that if there's like an important call out, I'll go ahead and bring up the audio on this. But uh, Bert, I want to talk to you since you do build telescopes for a living. We just we're waiting for confirmation that we've latched in the mirrors into place. Can you explain how that works and, and what's involved there and why that's important? Well, the latching aspect is to make sure they stay in place, of course. Um, once those wings are deployed, um, they're driven by step motors to get them into position. And then basically they're locked into that position and they're never unlocked again. Um, the same thing happened with the secondary mirror deployment when the uh, arm came up from behind the observatory and like stuck the mirror way out in front. It's now stuck there. It's never going to be undeployed. And so that gives some of the rigidity and stability that we need in the structural elements so that they can begin the process of phasing the mirrors to get them into optical alignment. So how does, how does phasing mirrors work? Okay, and I'm, being, I'm getting a call out here to uh, uh, turn up your audio. So uh, Bert, I've got your audio maxed out on my end. Uh, perhaps you can increase your, uh, your level or, you know, shout or something. <laughs> That's a little bit better. I will try to speak a little bit louder. Okay. And I will try to see if I can get the uh, input of my computer a little bit louder. Is that any better? Uh, I, I hope so. That? Okay. Okay. So I think I, I think I turned it up a little bit. Thank you. Okay. So I've got, because um, I have your audio levels as loud as I can get them on my end. Uh, but uh, Urban Van Life is saying audio is perfect. So All right. if that's so we'll the case, that. I guess we're going to continue. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so the uh, mirror segments, the people will talk a lot about that over the next coming month. Um, each one of those 18 1.3 meter hexagons has to be uh, co-phased with each other so that they become, in essence, one contiguous optical surface, even though they're 18 separate surfaces. Uh, with just a couple millimeters gap between them. 
And uh, that process is a, a very careful, carefully done one, um, where basically they look at the image formed by the 18 mirrors, and um, they basically walk them in together so that instead of getting 18 uh, spots that are uh, not in focus, you get one spot that is in focus. And uh, the process to do that uh, is a very uh, complicated one uh, done with algorithms um, by the wavefront sensing experts. Um, and uh, they've rehearsed that many, many times using simulations. And they have, um, they're, they're ready for contingencies and things like that. Um, you've heard that talked about probably on some of the other live streams. And uh, the process will take, it'll be a month before they are in, into decent alignment at least. Um, they really have to wait until uh, instruments are turned on and they can start getting images to be able to do that alignment with. And so that process will be ongoing uh, over the next month or so. So, uh, okay, so it's going to take time for those mirrors to get aligned. Uh, the telescope is getting very, very cold, right? I mean, it's getting colder by the moment uh, ever since that sunshield deployed. I mean, I, I, I'm just so glad we're in the post sunshield is deployed era of our lives. But now that that sunshield is out there, the telescope's getting colder. Do you know, Bird, if they need to still wait for those mirrors to reach a certain temperature before they can start moving them around and, and adjusting them? Uh, well, first they have to unlock the mirrors. Um, every one of those mirrors is launch locked. In other words, there's um, they're being gripped so that during launch, they didn't break off of their mounts. Um, those launch locks are, are going to be uh, unlocked over the coming weeks. And then by the time you are at L2, uh, it should be cold enough where they can start doing, the, the wavefront sensing group can start doing their job. I don't know exactly the time schedule for that. I'm not uh, privy to that at all. Um, but the uh, time that it takes to do that will allow it to have cooled down quite a bit. And there's just that ongoing settling that will be happening as the um, as, as it cools down and as the structures uh, do what's called outgassing, which means uh, any uh, particulates that are in there that, that could, could be water, it could be other uh, contaminations, or it could just be uh, particles inherent to the, to the properties of the materials, will, in essence, the mirrors will dry out. The structure will dry out a little bit in the vacuum of space. And so that, that little bit of settling actually takes a long time to happen, but the majority of it will happen uh, in the first uh, few months during commissioning. Oh, I can't hear you, Christian. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, so thanks, Bert. That's really interesting. So we now are just, I think Herb Ross here had a question uh, that I think is uh, probably the most salient one of them all. And Patty, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, offer this uh, question to you, please, because you are there and kind of like the headquarters perch of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, is this proceeding as planned? Oh my goodness, Christians. Uh, this is proceeding so fantastically. Um, you know, there's a notional timeline for any mission that you're gonna launch and then get into its final orbit and then commission the science instruments. And those timelines have, like I said, notional and expected progress at each step, but there's also built in contingency time so that the team can take a look at the data that's coming down, the telemetry that's telling you about the health and the safety of the spacecraft at any given time, and, and proceed accordingly, you know, take some time to make sure you understand the system in space and move on. And so the fact that the JWST uh, deployment team is hitting all of these milestones right on schedule, perfect deployments, um, it's just so fantastic to watch and, and putting it into the perspective of other missions and, and you know, that there's always something that surprises you on the way to your final science um, um, configuration. I'm just so pleased for the team, so thrilled for the team that everything is going well that you needed luck for, but also so proud and amazed and humbled by this team for all the work they're, they're, they're doing around the clock during the holidays in the middle of a global <laughs> pandemic to, to yeah. make sure that every step is just, you know, very strongly acquired and then we can move on to the next. So happiness, big time happiness. <laughs> That's a great way to describe it, Patty. Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> actually, uh, 
I don't know which one of you wants to take this one, but RJ has a really good question. On launch day, uh, I mentioned several hundred points of failure at this point. How many points of failure left over? Well, I believe that when it before launch, uh, it was counted at about 344 single points of failure. Are there any points of failure remaining? I'll ask the panel. Anybody know? No? Nobody knows? Um, I mean, I don't know we, if we have a numerical, you know, quantified way of saying it now. Yeah. But there's uh, certainly, you know, many, many, and, and maybe Bert knows better than this, but there are over 100, um, you know, release mechanisms that had to work just today in order to fully deploy that final segment of the mirror. So that's got right. to have retarded a huge amount of the of right. The Yes, the number is much lower now. I don't know what it is either. <laughs> I did hear uh, during one of the media teleconferences uh, that was uh, done, or actually it was a media telecon that was done on Monday, uh, the estimation was that once the sun shield was deployed, the sun shield, something like 75% of the risk and therefore 75% of those single points of failure were retired. So I would think that right. we are now at least 90 plus 95 97 percent maybe who knows we're, 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 we're basically done now they do got to latch this thing and this takes time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh so that can't be uh that can't be dismissed very easily um so let me just uh see if there's any uh <laughs> thank you dylan very much uh for you the words the nerd this nerd is giddy yeah i think we're all giddy today and uh this is such a great day for all of us all. So, the guys, this is, like I said, this is our Festivus. Uh, so, what else is mm -hmm. next? We talked about the phasing of the mirrors. Oh, and by the way, th thank you very much, Seth, for, for the for the five pound super chat. This, this is my favorite space channel. Well, thank you very much. We're so, so glad to be here. So, let me ask you guys a question. Uh, when we are, obviously, the big question is what is next? And we talked about phasing of the mirrors and getting them aligned to form a single image. But there's got to be much, much more down the road after that, correct? And can anybody discuss what the what some of those next steps or the, the following steps will be? So right now we've got an observatory that's fully deployed, right? As soon as that latching is complete, that's the last step of deployment. We haven't turned the science instruments on yet. And so that is what is going to collect the data that we are so excited about, you know, seeing. It's going to allow us to see beyond what we've been able to see before, even with the Hubble Space Telescope and other observatories in the ground and on space. So the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to reach L2. You know, we're, we're cruising out there going towards L2. And at that point in time, a few days later, maybe a week later, the near cam turns on. The first science instrument will turn on. And then you'll start to talk about, we we're, we're going to see what Bert was talking about. You know, we've got these 18 mirror segments and they're operating independently as we begin here. But there's a team that's ready to go to look at images falling onto the science instrument from those 18 mirrors and to, you know, work with the actuators on each mirror and the, and the data that they're getting down to make those mirrors act as one. And it's going to be this really complicated intricate interplay between the science instruments and the mirrors and the teams to get the whole observatory to be truly you know fully aligned with all the instruments and all the mirrors and so that's going to take a while and that's going to be really exciting to see and i feel like you know that's where our risk lies now is in you know getting these instruments uh, aligned uh, on board uh turned on and getting the mirrors aligned Wow. Okay. So the mirror alignment is the, is a key thing, and then you mentioned the instruments. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of calibration, uh, and then of course everybody wants to know when are we going to see the first images. Uh, this has come this has come up a few times, but uh, Aaron, can you uh, help us understand uh, when we might expect uh, those first images and and what they're going to be? Yeah. You, you, so, you, you know exactly um, what they're going to do, right? Image will be um, on things that we actually don't know yet. So these are called early release uh, Stand objects. Stand by for a ESOs. second. Stand by for a second. I'm going to bring yeah. up the audio here. Sure. How do I sound now? Do I sound OK? OK. OK, good. All right. So um, there will be a set of um, um, early release objects. Before I before we continue, uh, let me. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it sounds like there was a uh, basically just letting folks know that uh, there will be a commanding outage. Uh, they're still going to be getting live telemetry. That's exactly what we're seeing right here. We're we're literally simulcasting their stream.
Oh. Go ahead, Michelle. telescope itself is now uh, more than twice as far away as the moon. It's about 600,000 miles away today, and it's going out to about a million miles away, uh, a point called L2, the Lagrange point, a balance between the gravity of Earth and the Earth and the sun, a wonderful place to park the telescope for the long and hopefully very successful mission ahead of it. It's been an absolutely incredible journey. Uh, the, uh, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope launched on December 25th from French Guiana, from Corot. Uh, this is the main launch site of the European Space Agency, one of the major partners in the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, other major partners include the Canadian Space Agency and, of course, NASA. And uh, the, uh, the telescope has been on an incredible journey. Um, I have been honored to be working at Goddard Space Flight Center while much of it was built, so I was able to see some of the testing and some of the building of the primary mirror, as well as the instrument package. And, uh, and then it was uh, shipped to north of Grumman in California, where it was uh, uh, actually put onto the, um, uh, the, the the actual spacecraft. And you see here some of the, the integration. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, all right, so now it's just, it's just back to us. Uh, hopefully, uh, sorry about that, folks. I was trying to uh, listen in on the uh, call out, basically saying that there was going to be... Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you got that right. I'm not a professional sound engineer. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'll do the best I can. Anyway, um, so anyway, they were just basically saying that, oh, yeah, there's a certain amount of uh, time that they have to communicate with the Deep Space Network ground station in Canberra, Australia, and that they were going to be under a communication outage with the spacecraft. They're still getting telemetry. So that's the important thing. They just couldn't send commands. At least they won't, <clears throat> excuse me, they won't be able to send commands in about like an hour or so. But what you're seeing here is a live feed of the telemetry. There aren't any cameras on board, but there are in fact uh, instruments on board that are telling us everything about the telescope, including its configuration. And that's what we're seeing right here. Aaron, I do apologize. I, I know that I cut you off earlier to bring you silence when I didn't realize I was muted on the uh, on on the video, but you were talking about what? <laughs> I was trying to tell uh, our audience about the early release observations. Actually, I said yes, thank you. earlier. So basically, when the telescope is ready, they are going to take images of a handful of objects just to showcase the power of the telescope. So the list is being kept secret. I was told that not even some of the scientists know what is going to happen. So really, they safeguard it very heavily. But we will see them and hopefully happily be surprised when these objects come to us. So um, we expect them to come to us hopefully in um, six months after the telescope is fully commissioned. And then um, these images are not going to overlap with the early release science programs, which are the uh, real science programs that are selected to be carried out in the early phase of uh, the telescope. But we expect them to be um, images that are uh, uh, of objects that has previously been imaged with Hubble, maybe, so we can see the difference, or objects that we are very familiar with, for example, the Crab Nebula or the Pillar of Creation. So we have seen these gorgeous images from Hubble over and over again in media outlets everywhere. So we want to see how JWST perform over these objects as well. So um, it's going to be amazing, I think, just as the telescopes launch and deployment. So um, I can't wait to actually see them. But before that, there's still a few months to go. So they wouldn't tell you what the, uh, what the images were going to be, right? No, no, okay. not yet. At least this Bert, the, Patty, the do you know? we don't know. Nobody knows, huh? <laughs> first light, first light for every um, space telescope is always a closely guarded secret, but always a wonderful surprise gift. Exactly. Yeah, I, I know that they are going to select some targets that are that are pretty, uh, that are going to look really cool. And they're going to blow our minds. Uh, thank you, guy. Really do appreciate that. Actually, uh, we do uh, have a well, actually we have a couple of super chats here that I should probably bring up here. First of all, thank you very much, Gennaro. Uh, a game controller evolves into a muscle man under the world of... Wow. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. And then uh, Benjamin Wilson, thank you very much for the $10 Super Chat. 
aren't at least some of the some of the instruments working? Or is it possible for the telescope to be fully deployed, but no image information being set back to Earth? Uh, Patty, uh, do you have an understanding of the current status of the instruments? Or does anybody have I think a... Bert might be in a better oh. position to talk about the kinds of telemetry that are coming from all, okay. like, um, you know, spacecraft subsystems at this point in time. All right. Well, so I, I'm, I don't have any insider information on that type of things, um, and, and my... My job is, is more on the front end design and analysis side as opposed to operational. <laughs> Passing the buck, um, huh? <laughs> but, right. Um, the the uh, telemetry that is coming back, I think, is exactly what you're seeing on the screen. That, that is the public t t you know, t uh, telemetry. And that's really all I know. I don't have any more inside information than that. And as, as was already said, It'll take a while to turn on the instruments and uh, get them going, and I don't know when any of those uh, um, images go from uh, internal to what NASA will be putting out. So it sounds like then, uh, so instruments really are going to mostly come up, come online, I guess, after mirror phasing or perhaps during the mirror phasing portion. Uh, but then that uh, that's going to then lead to a, another couple of months of just getting those instruments fine-tuned, working, calibrated, and actually understanding just how they behave once they're in space, correct? Yeah, oh, very much that, so. The space field was tensioned only a few days ago, so the telescope itself is actually still cooling down. So I think what I heard is they have already turned on the cryo-cooler hmm. for MIRI, the infrared instrument, and also there's a special radiator for that but it still will take some time for MIRI to cool down to its operation temperature, which is only a few degree Kelvin. So, um, and also the MIRI itself is also still cooling, I think. So it has to reach its operation temperature of maybe around 40 Kelvin, which is still above that temperature right now. Excellent. So uh, another question that's come up quite a bit uh, is, uh, and let me see if I can't uh, adjust my chats here uh, better, but this is one that was asked quite a, quite a few number of times. Can we point Hubble back to JWST after it is fully deployed? Uh, I think, yes, we can. I guess maybe the question is, would we see anything? So there's actually a number of ground-based um, wide field surveys that are looking for transients. Um, they are basically looking at a large swath of the night sky from the ground uh, in the anti-solar direction, which is where L2 is, and that's where JWST is, is heading towards now. And they're already publishing just sort of like little snippets of their night of data tonight, where you can actually see the telescope. It's, it's catching light from the sun, and you can see it like wandering across their field and on its way to L2. So yes, telescopes can see um, the spacecraft at this point in time. They see reflections from the observatory and the sun shield. It's not like we can image it, um, but yes, we could see it with Hubble. I'm not <laughs> sure that um, anyone would. <laughs> like you'd have to uh, win the time or get the director's discretionary time to do it. But if you had a compelling reason to use uh, Hubble time for that, it should be visible. Uh, we're looking at the University of Hertfordshire, uh, Hertfordshire uh, who actually are doing among one of those uh, surveys that you're talking about, Patty. And uh, this is a image stabilized, or this is a stabilized image. Let me zoom this up just a little bit, just to let you guys see this a little bit better. Uh, but this has been stabilized so that we can track uh, we can track Webb. You may notice that there's actually a slight backing and forth of Webb's uh, apparent motion across the sky. Uh, so what do you think that is causing that slight wobble back and forth? I think oh, that's okay. just a video artifact. What's that? That's just a video artifact. A specific what? That, that is just a video artifact. Oh, it's a video artifact? Okay. I thought it was because of the uh, fact that Earth is rotating underneath and it was a parallax effect maybe? I don't know. It's cool though. I can't actually see what you're talking about. Uh, so if you watch, like, at least when I watch it, it seems like it, okay, now it seems like it goes backward and then it goes forward. It goes into retrograde, comes forward. Is anybody else seeing that or is it just me? It's probably just me. Oh, well, maybe it's an effect of that, that I'm getting. Yeah. So anyway, if the Hubble telescope were to look at it, I guess the question is, would it resolve the sun shield? And obviously this is irrespective of whether or not there's a justification to do that, but I'm not even sure how well it would be able to resolve it. I, I know Hubble's got very good resolution, but 
but I don't know if once web is all the way out at L2, if it's actually going to uh, be large enough to be seen, uh, you know, and resolved by Hubble. I don't know. It, it would, even Hubble's 2.4 meter aperture mm -hmm. um, at, at a million miles away um, would, would only resolve James Webb as a point of light. So you're saying it would be a and point? And a moving one. Yeah. Right. It, it would be what you see here, basically. So Hubble would have to somehow be able to move and track probably a lot faster than what it's designed to, right? At least until uh, no, it actually I, I reaches. Yeah. It, uh, Hubble can track a uh, planet, you know, with uh, items within the orbit in the solar system. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, again, it would simply be a point of light simply because uh, the 70 meter sunshade at a distance of 100 uh, a million kilometers is still going to be a single point of light on a pixel. <laughs> Mike says, trust the telemetry data. Yeah, exactly. Let us trust the telemetry. Speaking of telemetry, we'll just jump back over to uh, to this uh, other shot just so we can see uh, how things are looking. Uh, and uh, what do you know? We still have a telescope. <laughs> it's tremendously exciting. Uh, so... Uh, I guess uh, I guess another uh, question that we have coming in here is, uh, could we be seeing something like the canals on Mars? Well, obviously there aren't any canals on Mars uh, per se, but are we able to see surface features? Well, Hubble can see surface features. Will Webb be able to resolve for surface features on Mars as well as Hubble can? I would say that um, it depends on, so we have to remember that Hubble actually observed in uh, panchromatic wavelengths, so going from near UV to near infrared, but Webb is designed to look at near infrared all the way to mid infrared. So I don't think this, uh, this wavelength is actually good for uh, highlighting the feature on the surface of Mars. Mm -hmm. And not that I know, I think the surface of Mars is pretty cold, so um, there's probably not enough variation in there to make uh, a meaningful map of Mars using GWST. But I think they do have planned a program because um, when Jim Green and Heidi Hamels was working on the telescope when in this development phase, they specifically put this requirement back in to make sure it can track Mars and everything that moves slower than it. So the outer solar system planets like um, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune JWST can track them, and there is this uh, early release science program had by uh, Heidi Hamill that uh, will be visiting all these ex uh, outer solar system planets. So um, there will be interesting science there. I just don't know enough to give the details. Excellent. And uh, just want to say uh, thanks for some super chats that came in. Uh, so let me go back to her hand raised. Okay, Patty, do you have your hand up or do you want, want to say anything or feel free to just I was just going to quickly po point out that there is a um, solar system um, team that is going to be using yeah. web to do complementary observations to, you know, the types of missions that we send to the planet to take much more high resolution uh, data. And in particular, the wavelength range of web will allow um, things like a global measurement of things like methane and deuterium, which are important um, pieces of the puzzle to understand how the Martian atmosphere started and evolved and what it's uh, really like today globally. So yes, there's a huge team of folks that are ready and excited to use web to explore uh, features of our solar system, including Mars. Fantastic. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll be joined later on by Heidi Hamill. Uh, I know that she has, she was going to come on earlier, but then uh, she got ordered by her bosses to be on today's uh, press conference, which we are going to cover. In fact, that was sort of like the original plan was to bring you the press conference and, and continue uh, our chat afterward. And then Heidi would at least join us then. That's still the hope. We'll see what happens, right? Uh, big thanks to RJ for this uh, generous super chat. Uh, growing up with Apollo, always appreciated Jules Bergman's ability to present engineering details to non-engineers. Christian, you're doing that tradition in fine style with better hair. Well, I, I thank you, RJ. That's very kind of you, and I will, I will, I will agree with you. Yes, my guests have incredible hair. So, uh, and as well as expertise. So, I'm very, very thankful for them. Thanks so much, buddy. And uh, we also have uh, just another very generous super chat from Phyllis Dennis. Uh, no message. Just wanted to acknowledge that and just say thank you and and just appreciate your uh, your generosity. This is helping to keep the lights on. So. Um, so, John, uh, why are there two interviews at a time? Yeah, this would be a good time just to kind of quickly recap. So, 
what we are doing is uh, I'm simulcasting NASA's uh, live stream. When this was put together, the actual timeline, like specifically when things were going to happen, is unknown, and that's by design. It's not. It's not because it was a secret. It's because the engineers, who you can see now working in the Mission Operations Center, you know, they're basically reading the telescope and making decisions as to when to proceed with certain procedures, when things are going to be taking place. And so what it came down to is that I thought, okay, they're going to deploy this mirror uh, in the morning. They'll be done by noon, right? And then we can go live and we can have our own little conversation about it. Well, no, they're not done yet, you know, and they're still in the process of executing a m number of latches. So I thought, well, maybe I should have that up just so that we can kind of talk about the telemetry but then of course they're doing their interview. hey guys we're figuring it out as we go along so anyway hopefully that explains what's happening um ah okay it looks like they have concluded their cover no damn it <laughs> they have not concluded their coverage i thought they were done <laughs> oh well we're, we're we're figuring out but it looks like they are taking a break which is actually kind of good because now we can just leave this up and then we can uh we can we can chat uh so yeah, so yeah, Bert, uh, yeah, Bert even pointed out in the chat, it's a meta interview. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, all right, let's see what other questions that we have here. Uh, we've got a, uh, so this is also, again, to uh, the point that you were making, Patty, about uh, would J JWST be able to keep track of geysers on Enceladus? Uh, I think that is part of the, uh, part of the solar system observation program, correct? Absolutely. Um, you know, this is a great question for Heidi. So I, I think you should save the bulk of the, um, you know, the meat of that question for Heidi. But exactly. this is one of the main things that that solar system working group is looking to do is to make sure that NASA's, you know, assets in space work collaboratively. And what observations can Webb take now of those icy giant moons around Jupiter and Saturn, where we know there's a huge amount of water and water is the key ingredient to life on Earth, our one example of a planet with life. Um, we want to go explore Enceladus, um, other planets, Europa, you know, that have, you know, huge amounts of ice and hopefully we, we are pretty sure oceans of water below them. Um, we're going to be sending missions there. How can Webb help us to fine tune the details of those mission operations so that we can, you know, use those assets to the best of our abilities? And Heidi will have much more to say about that, I'm sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so uh, Gennaro asks, uh, when might we learn more about the Sagittarius A-star black hole from JWST? Now that, as I understand it, that's a black hole in our galaxy. And Aaron, you seem to know a lot more about, you seem to have forgotten more about galaxies than I'll ever know. So do you want to take this question and, and talk about what Gennaro is asking about and what JWST might be able to help us learn? i try. So, um, well, this is a bit too close to what I do because... Uh, I, I look at galaxies for that form in the edge of the universe. So this is very, very close to us. So if I understand correctly, this is actually the one that they were looking at with the um, uh, Event Horizon Telescope. So um, unfortunately, I don't think um, JWST will be at too much to that type of observation si simply because of the scale of um, uh, the event, because um, the direct imaging of a black hole is actually at a scale that is much smaller than um, uh, the thing that encompasses the black hole, which is called the active galactic nuclei. You know, when the black hole is accreting, there is materials that accumulate and to be uh, accreted by a black hole at a later time. And that is, you know, usually shows up at a, as a bulge of a galaxy. So JWST will be able to help us find a lot of these active galactic nuclei or qua uh, quasars. But um, for Sagittarius A, I don't think um, maybe they will add complementary infrared observations in there to help us better understand that one particular black hole. But um, I, I, yeah, that's as far as I know, um, that they probably would not be directly uh, working together with um, the ETH to, to understand uh, Sagittarius at the, the, at the black hole scale by itself. But we will be able right. to observe. Um, things or radiation near the black hole and to help us right. understand the environment better right so to see the to, to see the the event horizon of the black hole or the photon ring or whatever basically you want to see like the environs right there at the black hole you do need a, a telescope the size of earth right web is not that big it's big but not that big but your point is that they'll be able it'll be able to uh, help 
sense that environment around the black hole on a, on a larger scale, but still a lot better because it is, in fact, an, an infrared telescope. And there's a lot of galaxy in the way between here and there. So being able to pierce that veil is, uh, is, is pretty critical. Uh, Double D, thank you very much. Really do appreciate that. Uh, and uh, my very kind of you to say. <laughs> very kind of you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, um, so Shares uh, says, is it possible to see how far away JWST uh, will be from Earth in one screen upon placing at L2 orbit? Well, actually, there kind of is already. Uh, and let me go ahead and bring this up here. Um, I'm going to switch over to the Where is Web uh, website, uh, WEBB site. And let's go ahead and change this over to Safari. We'll take a look and see just where Web is right now. And now you can see uh, we've got this uh, terrific web page that tells us, well, a decent amount of the telemetry, right? So what do we have? We have the distance to L2 that left to go. This is a scale. This is not the size, but this is in the correct scale of distance. Am I correct on that, guys? Is this right? What are we looking at here? Burke, do you have any idea what it is I'm showing here? I think I've explored this a little bit. So there are two modes, okay, right? You can uh -huh. uh, explore it by time or by distance. Okay. So I go by time. So, oh, yeah. Look at that. So it looks like we have... All right. Now, what's going on here? Uh-huh. So this is our distance. So this, this is our distance, and this is our time. So how come the two aren't identical? That is a great so question. I, <laughs> I was pondering about, about that this morning as well. So, Patty, do you know? If it was linear and go the time toggle and between the two again. Sure. Okay, so what am I looking at now? Because it's a little small on my screen. So this is what? This is the uh, where is web time web page. This is the distance view and this is the time view. Okay. So what's the sure? So so time well, think, is think, linear, right? Well, I think and, but as far as where we're getting to L two, we're sneaking up on it, right? We're we're hoping to hit L two at just the right velocity away from the earth that the station keeping to to stay in l2 is going to be minimized so i think what you're seeing there is is a perfect injection uh and and bert i i know that you were commenting on that a moment ago is that is that kind of jiving what you were saying or right right if it if it just um shot out to l2 at a constant speed then the time and distance scales would be would match up exactly but mm -hmm. if you look at the cruising speed mm -hmm. right there it's 0.3981 what is that? Oh, sorry. Uh, point, uh, yeah, about 0. 0.4 kilometers a second. Four kilometers per second, right. Yeah. Well, I remember uh, I about the time I was too. passing the moon, I remember that number was more like 0. 0.7. Mm -hmm. and, and so you can see that it slowed down considerably. Well, what happens? You're, you're shooting something, at, you're throwing something out to L2. Well, don't forget, there's still gravity happening, right? Mm -hmm. And so what would happen if you just did nothing mm. and you threw something out? Well, it would slow down and it would come back. And so what's happening is analogous to if you started up your car, hit the gas, and, and started go driving up a hill. Well, if you take your foot off the gas and put it in neutral, you'll still going, be going up that hill, but you'll be slowing down. And getting to L2 is like getting to the top of a hill where you want to apply just the right amount of gas at the beginning hmm. and come to almost a stop at the top of the hill. Because when it reaches L2, it'll be moving very slowly. And it's like getting up to the top of that hill, making a right turn, and then flooring it. And what they do is then they do the last uh, uh, burn, which puts it into the halo orbit, which maintains that stable um, projection uh, of the L2 halo orbit going around the sun along with the Earth uh, orbiting the L2 point. Okay, so this uh, this L2 orbit is, uh, you don't want to overshoot it. It's basically the problem, right? I mean, because if you overshoot right. it, if we overshoot L2, James what, what's Webb wrong James Webb has no brakes. Oh, okay. The, James Webb has no brakes. And it can't it can't turn around and fire its thrusters back to the Earth because you'd be exposing the telescope to direct sunlight, and that would end the mission basically. And that would be bad. It, okay, so uh, that's just because once it turns around, it what happens? So like obviously it, it's not is not because the sun is necessarily too bright for Webb, although it is. But what is the real reason why it would ruin the telescope? Well, it would heat it back up. Yeah, and it. It would exceed its survivability limits of the, not necessarily the telescope, 
but all of the electronics and sensors and everything could be permanently damaged. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so uh, since we're talking about telescopes, I'll, we'll do one more telescope question really quick, and that's from James Dugan. How does JWC track a target? Does the mirror move like an alt as telescope mount, or does the whole spacecraft move, or is it a combination of both? And uh, actually, I think I've got uh, an animation that helps us to visualize it. So let me go ahead and try to bring that up uh, once I can find it. And then, uh, you know, this is just me. But if you want to go ahead and maybe somebody wants to speak to how web is going to move, uh, then I can bring up a visualization. Actually, here's a visualization. Now I'll go ahead and switch to that right here. Actually, see, I try to, I try to, there we are. So let's see. Ah, okay. I've got this, uh... Oh, sorry about that. It's a nice one. I hadn't seen that one before. Yeah, and I just had it, and I just lost I had, it. I had not seen all of that either. It's a little bit older, but it still works. Uh, sorry about that. Let me bring this back up here. All right, so uh, do you want to maybe describe what it is that we're seeing here? Uh, Bert or anybody? Well, sure, it's, it's showing the relative orientation of the uh, Sun, Earth, Moon, and James Webb. And it's really nicely showing how the shadow is you know, projected um, where the observatory changes its uh, alt uh, attitude and what its ranges are. It can only have a small range in certain angles and larger in others. And of course, it has the 360 degree rotation about, about the axis normal to the uh, sun rays. And so the answer to the question is the entire observatory uh, does do the pointing. The mirror itself does not do any, any pointing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 100% controlled by the um, uh, avionics on the spacecraft. And then uh, the only thing that is controlled internally is the uh, uh, fast steering mirror removes the residual jitter in the image. So there's a there's a mirror inside that's kind of like an Ill image stabilization mirror. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, okay. The telescope when I mean, we talk about the telescope out in front of the instruments is actually comp comprised of four mirrors, mm. um, count, counting the 18 segments as one, as the primary mirror. Okay. Um, you got the primary mirror, you've got the secondary mirror, and then you notice that little structure that's in the center of the telescope. Uh, yeah, let me, um, uh, let me kind of bring it, let me kind of bring the animation back a little bit here. Uh, so that structure right there at the very center, so uh, where my, I don't right. know if you can see my mouse or not, but it's kind of right there sticking out like a little nose sticking out. Uh, yeah. from the primary mirror? Right. So the light reflects off the primary mirror to the mm -hmm. secondary mirror. And as it enters into that, uh, that nose, there's actually a cutout there that is very similar in shape to the uh, layout of the uh, science instrument focal planes. Well, that's because the primary and secondary are forming an intermediate image uh, just as it passes through there. So it only lets light in that's kind of within that general field of view. And that's uh, really helpful for stray light not getting to the uh, instruments that, that's outside the field of use. And then inside of there is a tertiary mirror, or the third mirror of the system. And the primary, secondary, and tertiary work in concert to form the final corrected image that, this, that feeds into each of the science instruments. Now, when I said there's four mirrors, the fourth mirror is the fast steering mirror. So it goes off the primary, secondary. Secondary is heading back towards the instruments. Tertiary is heading back out towards the secondary again. And then there is the final fast steering mirror. And at the fast steering mirror is uh, what we would call a pupil. And it's an image of the primary mirror is uh, formed right about there. And so any shake that is occurring in the telescope just because of the residual uh, vibrational modes that every single structure has that image that might be a little bit shaking, that that uh, fast steering mirror counters it and, and will correct so that the final image at the image uh, instrument entrances are perfectly stable hmm. relative to the instruments themselves. So uh, right now, just to 
again, put all this in a bit of a perspective, and I was actually looking for the animation uh, as you were talking, Bert, and uh, at the risk of making you repeat anything, uh, I'll probably find that animation at one point. But I think uh, what since we are talking about mirrors, and since this is more up your alley, uh, I think what I'll go ahead and do is just bring up this, uh, uh, let's see, bring up, yeah, I think I'll bring up, the, whoop, nope, not that one. Uh, nope, we're going to bring up this one instead. There we are. Uh, so here we have a, uh, a comparison animation uh, of the uh, of the two mirrors. Uh, you know, obviously web's a whole lot bigger. Uh, so I guess one question we have, or one question I've seen come up a few times, and if anybody wants to speak to it as well, if web is so much bigger than Hubble, surely it's going to see even better, right? It's going to have higher resolution, or is it? Or yes and no. Like, what are we what are we expecting it to give us in terms of image quality? That's right. Um, so basically, the resolute resolving power, angular resolving power of a mirror, is determined by the size of its um, primary mirror, the angu angular resolving power of a telescope. And so, by having a, a mirror that's almost three times wider, uh, about six and a half meters compared to Hubble's two point four meter mirror, uh, yes, it has a higher angular resolution. Uh, the sensors are also um, smaller uh, fields of view per pixel than Hubble's cameras. And however, its um, wavelength range is certainly longer, whereas Hubble can see ultraviolet, visible, and, and a little bit of near IR. Uh, James Webb sees a little bit of visible, like kind of the orange and red, the near IR, and well into the mid IR. And so at longer wavelengths, um, the diffraction, which is caused by the wave nature of light, uh, limits how fine of an uh, image you can form. And so the longer the wavelength, the less resolution you have. That is mm. one of the reasons James Webb had to be so big. Right. Uh, so in a, sense, in a sense that, you know, longer wavelengths with a bigger mirror, you can match the uh, smaller wavelengths of a smaller mirror in terms of just pure angular uh, resolution, what you can see on the sky. But at the at the you know shorter wavelengths that James Webb sees, it'll it'll have uh, many times the resolving power of Hubble. Fantastic. Okay, so basically, yes, Webb will definitely blow the brains out of Hubble in terms of resolution at infrared wavelengths, right? So it's not going to necessarily produce higher resolution images at visible light wavelengths. It can't because it's not sensitive to visible light, but it will outperform Hubble in the infrared. Mm -hmm. Well, at the at the high visible and low uh, near infrared, it will overlay some of the wavelength range of Hubble, and it will blow it out of the water, as you say. Uh, <laughs> but at the mid infrared uh, to uh, uh, I'm sorry, the higher low infrared to the mid infrared, uh, there is no comparison because Hubble can't see those. Right, right. So uh, we have a, another question here, uh, actually, and another super chat. I just want to get to uh, first of all, a very generous ten dollars super chat from uh, Adventure Adventure. Uh, do uh, well, I had it and I lost it. I'll try to bring it up again. There it is. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, do you believe the future Louvoir telescope will be the few will be the true successor of JWST? Ah, that's an interesting question, uh, Patty. Do you want to? I see you kind of chomping on that one. Do you want to champ at the video? You want to <laughs> yes. get to that? Get 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 go. Um, so the definition of Louvoir is the large ultraviolet optical infrared. Uh, observatory. It was one of four uh, next great observatory mission concepts that have been studied over the last five to ten years for prioritization by what we call the decadal survey. That's when the astronomers across the U.S. come together, rack and stack all the great ideas, and give us our like marching orders. What is our primary mission and science driver for the next decade? And we just got the decadal results um, in November, and it was a Louvre-like telescope that could. Uh, take spectra of atmospheres of small rocky planets like Earth in habitable zones around their stars and untangle the light to determine whether they have things like ozone, methane, oxygen, water vapor in their atmospheres. And that was our driving science. And our driving mission would be a Louvre-like mission, not exactly like Louvre, which was many times larger than JWST, but also not exactly like another mission that was studied called HABEX, the Habitable Exoplanet mm -hmm. Explorer, which was, you know, a couple times. It was, it was less, it was smaller than JW. It was bigger than Webb. It was kind of in the middle there. So the decadal survey said, kind of shoot in the middle of those two extremes. Go about Webb size, but use next generation technology 
um, to go after these signatures um, in exoplanet atmospheres and do so much more astrophysics that you can just do with like a next generation observatory. So absolutely, the Louvoir team, the HabEx team, everybody that is excited about our future mission concepts are watching JWST unfurl, fully deploy, and you know, waiting with bated breath to see how this stabilization goes that, that um, Bert was talking about, because those are the Pathfinder stepping stones to our next great mission, to the Louvoir-like HabEx mission. So yes, it will absolutely be the successor of JWST. At the same time, that community is so excited, enthusiastic, and anxious to get our hands on the data yeah. to see what you can do with JWST and also yeah. that mission CONOPS. I was going to say, we just got to get this web thing working, but uh, yeah, <laughs> but absolutely. Uh, so another question that came in uh, from uh, uh, Fester MP, uh, do you guys, let me see if I can go, do you guys work with NASA? Um, I used to, I used to work at NASA, uh, I no longer do, I'm now at, uh, I'm now at, uh, sorry, let me go back over to here. Uh, I'm sorry, I now uh, am teaching at Towson University, uh, but uh, Patty, uh, do you want to just go around clockwise, uh, counterclockwise here? So Patty, you, what is your position at NASA right now? So I do work at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, I'm in the astrophysics division, and I am the project scientist for an operating mission called TESS, which stands for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's been in space since 2018. Uh, it's doing an all-sky survey looking for transiting exoplanets, so planets that pass in front of their host star and block a little bit of the light, uh, looking for the nearest uh, neighbor transiting exoplanet systems. So these are stars that have transiting exoplanets and they're bright nearby stars. They're perfect targets for JWST. And in the first uh, year of observations, Webb will go after 25 newly discovered TESS exoplanets. Uh, to do exactly what we were talking about, look at the spectra and, and find out what's going on in their atmospheres. Giant planets, super Earths, uh, smaller planets. Um, and that's what I do at Goddard. Good work if you can get it. And speaking of the great work, uh, so Bird, do you want to tell us about what you do at NASA? Hi there. Um, Bert, there you so are. I'm, yeah, I don't mute, sorry. Uh, I'm an optical systems engineer. Uh, which is just a fancy way of saying we get the light to where it's supposed to go. Um, we often are working with science teams, uh, as individual scientists or science teams, uh, to make sure that we design something that meets the requirements that they put forth uh, to uh, achieve the science goals that they have. Fantastic. And by the way, just a quick interject here. Uh, thank you, Storms Crew. This super chat came in earlier, and I don't think I uh, thank you publicly for it. So thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Go web, go. Uh, so Aaron, and what's your role at uh, at Goddard as well? Yeah. So um, I'm Aaron Young. I am a JWST fellow, um, also at Goddard Space Flight Center under the NASA postdoctoral program. So um, I am actually a theorist. So I create galaxy formation models that model how galaxy formed, especially from the early universe. So I make all these predictions for what JWST can see in the future. And then I am on um, eight programs that will be executed by JWST in the first year. One of them are going to hunt over these galaxies forming within the first billion year of the universe. So I'm sort of the guy who's like, okay, this is how we understand the universe now. And this is how many galaxies we expect from the universe from this time, from these early times. And then I go off and tell the observers who are planning these observing programs, okay, this is what we know. Can you go, uh, this is how you can strategize your observation program. This is how to most efficient uh, that you can use JWST with this parallel mode to do the observations. And now you can come back and tell me how wrong these observations are, <laughs> how wrong my predictions are, right? Because I make predictions and we need JWST's observations to come back and help us fine tune or reform our galaxy formation model. So I'm sort of like the you know, guy well, that plays support in this row. Well, Aaron, even though you're a theorist, you're, you're, you know, you're more than welcome here anyway. So <laughs> 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 no, actually, this, this is great because you're helping to formulate the questions that we need Webb to help us answer. So totally agree with that. Let me get to a, another uh, question that we had here. And again, uh, in case you're wondering what the status of web is right now, uh, you know, it's, it's mirrors are fully out. Everything is in place. Now they're just, they're still latching everything. Like we're really are just waiting for that, for that call to come in, uh, that, uh, we actually do have a fully latched and secured mirror. 
Uh, but uh, another super chat from Scotty Die. Thank you so much. Really do appreciate it. God, you guys are being so generous today. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, not exactly a, a question, but I think one that's also of a great deal of interest. Uh, Gary Harrison asked, I hope to find out what's going on with Tabby Star. Uh, Patty, I know that your name is not Tabby, but are you familiar with Tabby Star and why that's so interesting? I could talk a long time about Tabby Star. You got you got thirty uh, so seconds. Tabby is okay. Tabitha <laughs> Boyajian is um, an astrophysicist, and she discovered this very tantalizing light curve signal that's from the Kepler Space Telescope. So Kepler was in orbit for about. 10 years. It was also looking for transiting exoplanets in a patch of sky that's up near uh, Cygnus in the, in the winter sky. So um, the pipeline looks for very simple transiting exoplanet signatures. They get, they're flat, they go down, they go back up, they dip again. That's your period. What Tabby found was this really strange signal where there were things that were dropping the flux of this one star by huge amounts compared to a transit, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent. And they weren't periodic. They were episodic. They were, they seemed almost random. There would be a bunch of dips and then nothing. Uh, and then a bunch more later. And it was no way to predict them. So it, it's become a really interesting oddball source. What's causing these dips? Whole bunches of theories. Could it be huge comets? Could there be a planet that, you know, exploded and has fragments that are dropping in front of it? Are there huge gas clouds or, you know, dust clouds near the star that are dropping the flux? So it's been really an exciting, um, system to follow. One of the more out there theories is that maybe it's something like a Dyson sphere that a, you know, very sophisticated civilization built around this stellar system. And a Dyson sphere was, you know, it was a science fiction idea uh, postulated by Freeman Dyson that you could put a structure around a star to capture a lot of its energy and use it for the planets in interior to that. Um, so we'd love to be able to collect more data to determine what exactly is going on at Tabby Star. What is causing these dips? Um, and could it be something like a techno signature as opposed to a natural phenomenon? Almost certainly not, but we need to collect the data that can, you know, answer that question. Uh, yes, JWST will absolutely look at uh, Tabby Star. There's a whole bunch of early release exoplanet observations to go after just those, you know, very exciting objects and see what we can learn with the new uh, technology um, and capabilities of Webb. Uh, there is another source right now that's just getting some press this week. Um, another oddball um, eclipser. Um, it looks like it's a giant, uh, you know, but but clumpy dust configuration around a system that's actually a binary star. And one of those stars in the binary is showing similar dips to Tabby's star. So when you look hmm. at 150,000 stars at once, like Kepler did, you're bound to find odd outliers. Tabby star was one of them. And now that Tess is looking again at, you know, huge numbers of stars and doing the same type of data collection, we're finding um, other analogs that look very similar to Tabby stars. Now we got two. I'm sure there'll be more. Fantastic. And uh, Alan uh, asked, uh, how risky and difficult is getting Webb into L2 going to be? I, I mean, it's not zero risk, right? I mean, there is a little bit of a, a trick to it, yes? Anybody who wants a, to talk orbitology? Yeah, who who knows the orbital dynamics? Bert, go, Aaron, because you deal with you deal with like galaxies orbiting, so you clearly no, know I about how how web at, orbits, right? Um, I think Bert was pointing at Patty, but I can take a stab at that. Too. <laughs> so I think one of the thing is, um, we think we so would have the they were worried to understand that what exoplanets the, are like. So exo. My fault. No Sorry about that. So. Is there something relevant that you can show? I'm trying. Uh, I think I'll try to bring, I think I'll go with this. There we go. Just just okay. to have that shot there again, just to give us at least the relative distance while I work out where to find my, uh, while I figure out where my other slide is showing the L2 orbit. Okay. Well, that's, um, that's good that you can uh, go look for that and I can talk for a little bit. So <laughs> one of the worry is that the Ariane 5 rocket, which is super powerful, would actually overshoot the orbit. So um, that's why there are these mid course corrections, but they also sort of leave um, a lot of headroom to not overshoot the telescope and let JWST do the steering, fine tuning its orbit on the way. That's why they call the mid course correction. So um, 
from what I heard yesterday, that um, the launch was actually exceptionally great with a delta v of you know ten to the minus a few a few uh, digits. So um, very great launch. Some of us think is is pure luck, but very very good luck that get us there. So uh, as a result of there, there uh, as a result of that, there are a lot of fuel left in the tank actually. In the first place, they were able to fuel uh, fill the tank all the way up, and so they left. Uh, the, the telescope left Earth with a lot of fuel, and now with this near perfect launch, there are even you know more fuel left in the tank, and so um, it will help JWST stay in L2 for longer. So actually, I was also heard, hearing that um, fuel will not probably be the main issue of JWST's lifetime. Remember, this is a sophisticated machine, and fuel is not the only reason that we can put it out of surface. We talk, we keep talking about it because this is something we know is bound to happen. But the good news here, perhaps, is that uh, fuel will no longer be the most uh, uh, worrying issue now because there are plenty of them left. Um, other than that, I think the launch was um, was the most risky part of the whole mm -hmm. business of getting GWST to L2. But and then the unfolding is what everyone is focusing on. Oh, and I, fa I found some of the graphics that I was going to try to have up now that you're done talking about it um so no i uh, i think this is uh one of the key things i mean we're trying to put this thing at l2 uh, the sun earth l2 because that's where it gets really really cold it's easy to block the sun earth and moon with just one sun shield uh but as we were as you were talking about aaron it takes a certain amount of fuel to get there um so when i'm looking at this when i look at this uh illustration here the the L2, it's actually orbiting around a point in space, right? The L2 is that mathematical point in the center there, but then Webb is going to be following in what's called a halo orbit around L2. Um, why is it going to take fuel and stuff like that to stay in L2? Anybody want to hop in on that? Go ahead, Patty. So I thought Bert's analogy for the vehicle going up the hill and wanting to get there, you know, with the, just you don't want to go too fast, you don't want to go too slow, but you want to go just right so that you're perfectly at the yeah. top when you get there was perfect, beautiful, right? And that that's how we envision these potential surfaces, right? And that's what, and that's what gravity of bodies causes. It causes things like hills and valleys, ups and downs. And so L2 is one of those types of surfaces, but it, it's a there's a fixed point there. Like if you were hit it just perfectly, you would stay there because of this perfect balance between all the gravitational forces. But L2 is actually marginally unstable. So if you were to put something there and don't do anything to it, within a few weeks, it'd start to wander away from L2. Mm. So what we do there is we station keep. It's just marginally unstable. So you have to do it. So it's a little bit of like peeking up back to get near it. And, and that halo orbit around L2 where we are is the one that requires, it's, it's basically optimized in many ways, right? It requires the least station keeping. It's very good for communications. It's very good for the thermal situation, um, but it is not perfectly stable. So the little bits of fuel that we need to use continuously through the mission is all about station keeping around that stable point. I'm sorry, the fixed point, which is the marginally unstable. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's, and I, and I switch my shots here because... Sorry about that. Let me, uh, uh, sorry about that, guys. I want to try to get my, why is this thing not returning back to my, all right, I've got a little bit of a hiccup here. Unpublish changes, revert changes. All right. All right. So sorry about that. I was trying to switch my shot around a little bit, uh, while I did some fiddling. And I'm just listening in. I'm going to go ahead and let you listen in. Uh, you're going to continue. Copy to continue. Right. So I just wanted to bring this up just because I was hearing them talk about door latch or mirror wing mirror wing latch. I thought, oh, are they about to get the call that that they've got a uh, a latched mirror? Um, but I think that they're still latching. So I could be wrong. Uh, but if anybody sure, at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, well, let Michelle take and it. I'm joined by uh, Julie Van Campen. She is the, uh, uh, the Deputy Commissioning Engineer for the James Webb Space Telescope. 
We had a, a wonderfully active and successful morning where the second wing of the primary mirror was deployed, and we are now yeah, in the final phases of latching that mirror in place. Okay, so we're still latching the mirror. Julie, can you give us a little bit of an update as to uh, what's going on? I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute this, and I'm going to return uh, to Keynote so that we can take a look at our... Oops. <laughs> oh. Match of the mirrors that were deployed today, the uh, the wing that was deployed today with the three mirrors on it. Um, this last command uh, will take a few minutes and it will pull the, the latch into its final uh, full load. And uh, we will hear them talk and, and as they give that last command. And then finally, they'll verify that the, uh, the command was successful and the motors uh, brought it to full uh, uh, load and you can see everybody here in the in the room is ready to see that last and final stage this is the very last move of our deployment sequence for the structural deployments for jwst just incredible it's been an amazing a little bit more than a week now it launched on uh, december 25th and uh, uh then the uh, the amazing sun shield was deployed so it began to cool of going down to an operating temperature of close to minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, after that, we had the uh, deployment of the secondary focusing mirror. Then yesterday saw the deployment of the first wing of the primary mirror. And uh, then today, the, the second one. And now we are finishing up latching that into its final stable configuration. Those latches will not be touched again. The mirror will be in, in its uh, final configuration. But that's not the end. Uh, in the weeks to come, there are some pretty uh, uh, important things coming up. And maybe, Julie, as, we, as we're waiting for this final conference, give us a sense about what's coming up next for the... Uh... So I'll just mute this for a second just to say that uh, I can't believe that uh, I'm actually getting the same level of excitement waiting for a telemetry call uh, as I did... Uh, at launch. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm just like, oh my god, this is so exciting. Um, so it sounds like what we just uh, heard is that we are waiting for this final latch. It looks like there's a series of latches that I guess go down uh, that, that wing of mirrors and they're just waiting for that final latch to lock in. Uh, anybody here a, a little bit kind of stoked about that? I mean, you know, it's just a little bit exciting, yeah? <laughs> Uh, you let's consider see. this is the last like visible large structure change of GWST, right? So we had a sun shield tensioned and then the secondary mirror came down already. Then at that point we have a telescope before the secondary came down, it basically reflecting all the light from the universe back to the universe. But now we have a secondary that can you know, reflect the light that collected by the primary into the scientific instrument, right? So now the two sides of the primary mirror came out. So GWST is basically formed as you know, it, it is fully deployed it's it's like it's like we're, we're assembling a, it's it's the next it's the closest thing i think we've seen to assembling a telescope in space it's the first time we've done anything like this right i think we, we yeah. kind of lose sight of the fact that we've never sent a telescope up into orbit that needed to do all these final deployment steps from you know six hundred thousand miles away so it's first of its right. kind when, accomplishment when when hubble went up it had to open up the sunshade door. <laughs> Let okay. The light in. Yeah. And and, and the yeah, secondary that... mirror did have to move around a good bit and the instruments need, did need to be commissioned. And of course we had the whole little Hubble trouble of the fact that the mirror was around with the wrong prescription and which actually generated quite a bit of innovation in the optical engineering field um, to, to fix that. And, and you can even say, in a sense, is applied in some of the optical designs here. Um, it, it's a wait, wait. It, it pushed it pushed us in both technology Admiral, and in the way we, we thought will continue to have what, what is possible in orbit. For another ten minutes. Hold, hold, hold. Command coverage will end in oh. four minutes. Okay. Uh, that was just a call out, uh, basically saying that. Because of the Earth's rotation, there are different ground stations that are unable to. Let me bring this up so you guys can hear. I, I brought it up just for them to go silent. Play command button. I see that on the ground, Cecil. That keyword looks good. CC. Next game. 
Guy's getting ready to take a picture. All of us are listening for that. <laughs> I know. We're all just waiting for that call out. It's just, it's just like, it's like everyone wants to capture confirmation that, that the mirror's been latched into place. Definitely done. Ops. Uh, we've only had five thousand steps remaining in our final latch reload move. Uh, we're down to four thousand. So, what do those steps mean? Anybody? Coffee? Rotations? 3,000. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Going quick though. You can see 3, the excitement. <laughs> 1,000. deployed JWST Observatory. Oh, right. oh yay! <laughs> All right! <laughs> Ooh, yeah. yes. Amazing. Oh, yes. Thousands so of people James around Webb. the world have worked on this. You see here, the people oh, at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. <laughs> it's like a moment to celebrate. 18 p.m. on January 8th. Oh, oh man. We'll get a little bit of audio from that room, too. Wow. Even if we don't, we can see the joy on their faces. Everybody, of course, being very, very careful with the COVID uh, surge. I'm joining you from an isolated room, so I can talk to you without a mask on. Everybody else is wearing their masks. Look what at the look at day. just look at that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> John, uh, yeah, I don't know what's happening. Uh, basically, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, what we just heard was the call out. Of the final, Even I'm a, a floor below the uh, control room. I can hear people cheering. What? Wait. All right. Telescope. Stand by for the project manager. Stand by. All right. All right. Uh, so I'll just try to do. I'll just try to answer this really quick. So what's happening is that they just tightened the final latch. Thanks, everyone. Here comes a here comes a big boss. The last two weeks have been totally amazing. Thousands of people have worked on JBST at this point to get, get us here. But I have a couple of special shout outs. One to the deployment team. You guys have done a phenomenal job over the last two weeks, but also over the last probably 15, 20 years to get us to this point. I do want to also thank the Northrop INT team and the Goddard folks participated in the actual stowing of the observatory about a year ago if they hadn't done it perfectly these last two weeks would not have gone as well as they have finally um, on a personal note I will tell you guys every single day I am honored and humbled to be associated with this team and I want to thank you all go JWST how about that? They did it. They did it. There's more to go, but they did it. All stations, be advised in just a few seconds. Station 3-4 will bring down the uplink. We will see a brief loss of telemetry at that time while they reacquire the downlink. They did it. The JWST is deployed. All those years of work, all of the design, the development, the Testing. Oh, I I want to tell This is the you head of science at NASA speaking. Just how excited and uh, emotional I am right now. We have a deployed telescope on orbit, a magnificent telescope the likes of which the world has never seen. So how does it feel to make history, everybody? You just said it. We're coming on the other side of a time that most of you would have spent with your families and uh, with a time that, frankly, even the last year, where most of you worked way harder than perhaps you ever worked in your life. And I just want to tell you how much I personally and we as an entire team appreciate your sacrifice uh, that you've given and also your family. Uh, your families the sacrifice they've given uh, to this amazing history-making uh, telescope. Uh, 
you know what? Work and not pay you back. Just know how deeply we appreciate and how deeply we value everything you've done. Uh, Bill, uh, it has been fun to watch you and uh, uh, working together with Craig and all the other leaders, kind of really building an amazing team. I think of it as a championship team. You never know how great the team is until you see them out there on the field. I love what I see. I love, we all love what we see. It's really an excellent team, and uh, you've shown the whole world. You cannot believe how many letters and emails I've gotten from around the world kind of congratulating uh, our entire agency, our entire country, our entire team, the international team for this work. Of course, uh, NASA Goddard is uh, leading with, with uh, so many of the team members here. Thank you. To each and every one of you, uh, North of Grumman, uh, it has been fun to get to know you and be with you on this journey. I'm only for five years on this journey. Many of you have been here for 20 or more uh, years, and some of us, some of uh, you are not even right now here anymore or because there are other projects or some have retired or are no, long, no longer with us. We think of them also in each one of them. Space Telescope Science Institute, what a great place to be here, looking out at the trees as we think of the deep space and, uh, you know, being a single team here. And that, of course, uh, the partner that's going to add a lot here uh, going forward. And role is Paul Aerospace as we're starting to work uh, with this entire team uh, going forward. So what I'd like to do is quickly just uh, introduce somebody else. And frankly, you're I haven't hearing here Mr. on the Bookin? phone. He's the head of and science at NASA. You, uh, the person a that I have on the audio trouble there. But as you can see, he's expressing his thanks and his emotion at uh, this amazing accomplishment of deploying the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. I actually have not received more I can hear super good. from anybody else uh, except my kids. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the last few months and weeks, uh, than my we'll friend. See if in a few more minutes, we get any more audio. You how much I appreciate his work and his partnership and friendship as we go forward. So I wanted to just see what he wants to add. A couple sentences. Uh, you it, tell me whether it, it's going to work. It, it yeah. Hang on for some one sec. Wait. I think it was Thomas's go audio, ahead. but he Did was just him? talking about go how ahead, much of an honor it is to uh, to be part of this incredible mission. And uh, I think they're uh, they need to be working on his, his audio right now. I think it uh, it's something that you hear a lot from people at NASA about how privileged we are to work in this group. It's something that you hear a lot of people say, but I, I have to really reiterate just how much we feel this. It is a it is a tremendous honor and privilege to work on something large, and to have a goal that you know I, I believe you know is noble. We are trying to advance knowledge. There are risks. We have never deployed an observatory like this before. Tens of thousands of people are actually waiting around the world for this to work, who have worked on this, who have given years of their life, as, as Thomas just said, their family as well. So I think with that, we're going to uh, leave, leave Thomas to give his conclusions. Okay, so Here's some applause in the background. Okay, so the uh, the final guest we have is. Uh, so so I'm going to uh, uh, just pause this. Uh, as you can see, uh, Michelle Thaler uh, has uh, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson on. Um, with all with all respects to Bill Nelson, I think I'll cut away and uh, just bring us back up here, so we're not too distracted. And then when something else really cool happens. Uh, yeah, let me, uh, <laughs> all right, so I had a screen here that would help me switch my scenes around, and I've lost them, oh, here it is, okay, so let me go back over here, uh, so that we could talk, and yeah, I know what you're talking, I know what you're thinking, guys, what a, what an amateur production this all is, it's because it is an amateur production, but it's a production made with love, I hope you, I hope you can at least appreciate that, <laughs> um, uh, just a lot of really cool comments coming in, amazing treat, feat for, for mankind, I'm an awe inspired by the team and all the peeps involved yeah I, I absolutely agree uh just you know how, how's everybody uh feeling right now obviously silly question Aaron start with you 
No, I just need to say, well, it feels like the end, but this is the end of the deployment, but the beginning of 10 years plus of science. You know, sometimes it gets me a little um, nervous because you see it's everywhere. BBC is covering it, all the big news outlets say, we're going to discover the origin of the universe, how galaxy formed after the Big Bang, the first stars, the first galaxies. But sometimes it gets me nervous because we are the people who are carrying out this science. So it's, it means we are going to be very, very busy for the years to come, you know, to, to do the observations, to process what comes back, to understand what those lights is trying to tell us. Sometimes I would say we just have to interrogate this information so that we can understand the universe more. So, um, yeah, this is just the beginning for us, years of exciting science, countless of, uh, you know, marvelous images. So, I, I, yeah. Thank you, Aaron. It's, it's great. And, and Bert, uh, as somebody who is responsible for helping to, to build this kind of hardware, I know you're not working on James Webb, but uh, what goes through your mind right now at a time like this when, you know, when yeah, the team wins like this? When, when you see uh, years of engineering come together and it works, um, <laughs> it's, 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 you know, the high note of an opera, right? Ah, right. <laughs> um, and, and it's uh, exciting. I mean, I've, I've fallen in love with astrophysics um, working on hardware um, because I was designing to meet certain specs that meant something specific to understanding the universe. Um, you know, when, you know, this isn't, this still isn't quite the high note for, for me. The high note is when we see images, when we know that right. the uh, wave fronts are phased and, uh, and all of the uh, optics are aligned. That that's more the high note for me. So I've still got to be patient and wait for that yeah. um, in the coming months. Um, but uh, on a personal note, it, it is very much uh, uh, enjoyable um, to understand that you know we're we're, we're getting a glimpse into uh, creation uh, that we haven't had before uh, into the mind of the creator, if you want to think of it that way, and uh, that that really turns my knob. So I enjoy that. Patty, how about you? How are you feeling right now? Oh, I, it's I feel amazing. I'm like, I'm, I'm just so. Yeah. excited and relieved at the same time you know future looking uh, what kind of data we'll be able to get with web that it was designed to do but even beyond that what are we going to get from web that it wasn't quite designed to do but that scientists and engineers will continue to work together while it's in space to really like optimize that system and make sure that we can push it to its cutting edge um, we've seen this on Hubble. You know, Hubble is making observations that it was never designed to do. In particular, exoplanet atmosphere observations. We didn't even know of exoplanets when Hubble was designed. We've really been able to push that telescope to its limits. And I'm just so excited to think about, like, here we are at a point where we can start to think about pushing Webb to its observational limits. We've waited so long, you know, and, and there were very disappointing delays and challenges of getting web on orbit but it was all worth it you know and and the the just to see this whole thing deploy so flawlessly and again the team that's doing this putting in all the hours that is required it is a lot of um it, it's a lot of giving to something that you love right astrophysics and space astrophysics to see it all coming being so rewarding here it's it's a it's hard to put into words, but it's really quite a day. It's like the 14 days of Christmas, honestly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, or, you know, it's a Festivus, right? <laughs> Here we are. We're just, this is like a, a, a huge party. And and, uh, and yeah, I, I think all of you just expressed this so eloquently. So I, I don't know why I'm even bothering to talk to talk right now, except to say that, holy crap, it's unfolded. It, you know, all of this was so hard to do. And, and I'll never forget when I saw the first animation of how this was going to go. And I'm, I'm, I'm going back to, what, 2002? Maybe 2000, 2000 maybe? I don't know, it's way back then. And I just remember looking at it, and I'm not an engineer, but I'm just thinking to myself, I is that gonna work, <laughs> you know? I mean, that seems awfully complex, guys. Is that gonna work? And well, it, it eventually did. <laughs> it just worked, uh, wow. But all, all that work that has to go in, all that, all that progress and setback that has to happen in order for it to just work, you know? 
Uh, and uh, Mike, uh, well, I think it looked you, easy, yeah, but it certainly isn't. I said it looked easy, right? When we were watching it, it looked like it all just worked. But boy, there's so much work and effort that went into, you know, seeing the flawless two weeks that we've had. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, there, you know, actually, it, it might be worth uh, having a little bit of fun talking about it now because it wasn't strictly speaking perfectly flawless. I mean, there was like an anomaly or two that happened, and you know what? Though they just dealt with it like they trained to deal with it and even anomalies are part of the process yeah yeah nothing ever goes perfect does anybody here have a familiarity with what happened uh you know so to speak what happened uh we were i was uh live streaming with heidi hamill uh a week ago yesterday uh we were waiting for that call out that the port mid boom had started to deploy and we never got that call out at least we didn't during our stream uh so does anybody know what happened happened there I mean, I could talk about it since I was actually working on... I was trying to make a video about it. <laughs> All right. Fun story, guys. I actually shot two videos this week <laughs> to talk about how the deployment was going so far, but they kept changing things around a little bit and things were happening. I was like, uh, let's go live. You've All right, here's what happened. Your videos What's that? I got to make videos you faster. Your videos <sighs> yeah, I need like I need like a, like a production team, you know, like, you know, editing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Hang up a second. Okay, so I'm just going to... Uh, okay, sorry if I'm being a little bit distracted here. Uh, let me explain what I just heard, and that is NASA has now finally... Uh, not finally, but NASA has concluded their uh, live stream of today's deployment. Uh, we're going to remain here, so this is like the after party. And then when NASA goes, hopefully it'll be soon. Hopefully NASA will go live soon with their press event. We can We can bring that to you. Uh, but uh, but for all of you uh, 12,000 people watching on the NASA live stream, welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, for this. Uh, and, uh, anyway, uh, I, I don't know how many people are watching, but uh, it, it's great. To, it's great. To see how many people are watching? Oh, my God. 1,600 people are watching. Oh, OK. Um, hey, good to see all of you. <laughs> um, so what was I saying? There was a little bit of of uh of a problem with the deployment uh of the midboom and this was uh basically you know there was a a readout that they were looking for in the telemetry some switches were supposed to be triggered when the covers rolled back and they were waiting for that for those confirmation signals to come in they didn't come in but they had those secondary indicators such as temperature and vibrations that were expected when the covers rolled back so then they did go ahead and proceed with the mid-boom deployment that led to a postponement of the rest of the activities on new year's day decided you know what we we we, we did the two mid-booms late into the night on new year's let's give everyone the day off and their mom sent them home literally their mom their mission operations manager sent them home so they went home they got some sleep they watched uh maybe they watched the mummers on on new year's day and then <laughs> patty knows what i'm talking about and uh we're both from we're both philly kids and uh they came back on Sunday and they were going to proceed with the tensioning of the sun shield, but then they discovered two new issues that they really decided to troubleshoot first, and that is that one of them was the tensioning motors running a little bit warmer than they wanted them to be running, and the second was that the power uh, was the, the the arrays weren't producing the power they wanted. They weren't getting the, the electricity from the arrays that they wanted to get, and so they were running on the battery a little bit more than they wanted to. They thought, you know what, let's just it's we're power positive. We're fine. We're not. We're not draining the battery. But what do you say we just retire these two issues before we go on with the sun shield? So, how do you how do you cool down the tensioning motors? You repoint the telescope slightly. Just change the sun angle on the on the motors. Let the motors cool. They cooled off just fine. What do you do about that solar array? That's not producing enough electricity. Well, it turns out it's running on what's called a duty cycle. So you don't want to. You know how you don't want to overcharge your batteries. You know, they always tell you, don't pl don't leave your phone in charged overnight. Don't leave your computer plugged in. We do it anyway, you know, but then we let our batteries overheat and we shorten the life on our batteries and we go out and buy new iPhones. Well, th this was what was happening. There was a solar array that basically tries not to feed too much electricity to the battery at once. And it was just set to be a little too conservative. So the battery wasn't getting quite enough. And therefore, it was starting to run on battery. They said, you know what, let's just go ahead and 
reset that what's called duty cycle. Let's get this thing uh, back in business. Then they started just tensioning sun shields on Monday, Tuesday, deployed the secondary two days early uh, on Wednesday, and it's just been flying ever since. Sorry, that didn't mean to didn't mean to take over there, but uh, hey, you know that uh, that that those were the glitches. Ooh, big deal. <laughs> big deal so anyway um there was a um there were there were actually some more questions uh and some super chats that i'd like to uh acknowledge uh that have come in and uh if you guys are good to hang out for a bit uh well first of all uh, urban van life uh 10 pounds thank you for all the effort to put into soup put in for stupid people like me who know <laughs> oh man thank you my friend and believe me we're all a little stupid so uh if they can't get the mirrors aligned correctly, will they still be able to get images better than Hubble? That's an interesting question. Anybody want to field that one? There's all kinds of contingencies. Yeah. Um, you know, um, if you need to ignore a mirror to, um, you know, get an image from, say, 17 of 18 mirrors, that can be done. Um, there's as much as you've seen the team prepare for like launch contingencies, deployment contingencies. Um, we'll see the same thing happening with like instrument operations contingencies and, and anomalies on board. So it's very, very common. I mean, this, this is how space missions life cycles unfold. Um, there is always an end to a mission and it's because systems are getting old. So at some point, uh, you could expect that we would have to say, ignore some of the mirrors. Uh, or use instruments in modes that are not, you know, maybe not using the full suite of modes. So yet yeah, there's lots of science that you can do with a not fully deployed um, JWST with 18 operational mirrors. We certainly don't have to worry about that anymore at all. Uh, you could have done science with both those mirrors folded back. You'd still have a beautiful, huge mirror that could, you know, tune up, tune itself up. Uh, it wouldn't have 18 segments. It would have less, either three or six less. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, we can do all kinds of uh, transformational science with a um, you know, partial JWST, but at this point in time, we do not need to be thinking about those contingency plans. And that's great. <laughs> yeah. That's that's really great. Uh, so another question uh, that that came in. Oh, actually, uh, thank you, Nick. Just saying thanks for this presentation. You're more than welcome, and thank you for the super chat. Really do appreciate it. And Eric, thank you for your pair character doing a shake sign with his hands. Saying, "Go!" I, I just love the fact that Ecam cannot like generate the uh the the animated gif that youtube does so it gives me this description which is just great <laughs> uh let's see there's a uh well this one came in this is a while back uh uh sorry about the worthless brazilian money oh please no thank you so much has the astronomical community been thinking about the new capabilities that would be made after starship becomes operational that's an interesting question. Um, and, and, and actually, a second super chat. Thank you so much. What could be done with a fairing volume of 1,100 cubic meters and 150 tons of payload all the way up to Earth's escape velocity, costing as low as 50, $50 million per launch? Gee, that's an interesting, well, that's an interestingly worded question. What could we do with a bigger rocket and lower launch costs? Bert, you're the engineer. What, 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 what would you build? bigger telescopes <laughs> uh would um, do you think do you think that we would just forget all this deployable stuff and just stick it in you know stick a fixed mirror in or would you go with a folded mirror and make it even bigger there have been studies published since um <clears throat> about 2010 uh one of the uh precursors to louvoir was called um uh, ATLAS, which was Advanced T Technology Large Aperture Telescope. Um, you can Google that, and there's uh, yeah. I'll see if I can. I'll see if there. I can bring that up here. And that was looking at exactly that. What could you do with the? You know, they were talking about you know the big Falcon rockets. They were talking about um, um, you know uh, future um, NASA rockets, um, which are now you know the SES. And that they would have large fairings, so why not send up a monolithic mirror rather than a segmented mirror that has to be origamied? Um, and so, you know, that is technically possible, but the development on that has not been done, uh, obviously, to the level that James Webb has been done. But, uh, you know, that is a technical possibility, but it requires a lot of work uh, and time to get something like that designed. 
This uh, this is probably not what you were referring to. It looks like there's been a number of, of uh, studies called Atlas, uh, but I'll just go ahead and bring this up, and, and you tell me if this is what... Uh, it's at last, L-A-S-T. At, oh, at last. Okay, so I'll go ahead and thank you, and I'll I'll bring up the wrong at last, and now <laughs> I'll and now you can watch me Google in real time. At last. While you do that, maybe I can um, add a little bit to what Bert said. Um, you know, there, there, I think the commercial and uh, NASA c combination of using space and maximizing what we can do there is super exciting, including the manned space program. So in addition to the studies that Bert was mentioning, there have also been some in-space assembly studies. And so you can imagine combining these two con concepts, right? Get a bunch of big glass up into space and then let astronauts uh, put them together. Uh, to make an even bigger structure. So yeah, all kinds of exciting follow-ons uh, in the future that visionaries are thinking about. There you so, go. That's so this, that last. this was it. Okay, so this is the precursor to Louvoir, right? No. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. So this would have been a ten-meter class observatory, uh, and obviously they're not proposing a ten-meter in the current decadal survey, right? So what did they propose in the current decadal um, survey? There were two versions of Louvoir. There's Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Bert. Sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, 9.2 meters and 15 meters, as as uh, Patty's about to say. So, what did what the decadal uh, or what was recommended in in the uh, current uh, decadal survey? Was it the nine meter? Was it the 15 meter? Was the it smaller version of the nine meter? Ah, okay. Yes. Cool. Uh, About 6.5 in in the interior, right? I love his double D now said phasers to calibrate. <laughs> uh, so 6.5. So basically we're talking about an optical version of web, right? So it would have the same aperture as web, the same size. It would quote only be six and a half meters. Uh, but hey, I mean, that would still be an enormous. Actually, that, that raises a question. Um, you know, there's a number, there's got to be a number of constraints that decide just how big. I mean, are we building, did we really just launch this? this uh six and a half meter infrared telescope because we thought it would be cool or or is there a, a better reason where this is there a reason for this particular size or what are the reasons that mm -hmm. set the size for for spacecraft well uh, obviously it had to fit inside the fairing of what was at the time the largest fairing available the arian 5 rocket um original designs did have you know that third row of mirrors around there in the uh in the um, next generation space telescope but uh you know it got scaled down for budgetary and realism uh you know issues that, mm -hmm. that go along with you know what you can build and such but just remember you know um, everything about james webb is tuned to answer specific questions to do specific observations in the early universe um where things are expanding away from us uh, at a high rate everything is shift, uh, shifted to the red, red shifted. Um, some, some of that early first half billion to uh, two billion years are shifted between Z of uh, 10 to up to maybe even 30, 40, uh, which means you've got to look out to the 20, 30, 40 micron uh, range to be able to make those observations. And web is, you know, sized and the instrument sensors uh, are designed and scaled. The optical designs are all synchronized to um, try to capture with the best resolution possible uh, with a six and a half meter telescope such as James Webb at the temperature that it's at, at those wavelengths to get those redshifts to make those observations. It all fits together. Um, it's not, not nothing about the design is an accident. Uh, speaking of uh, design uh, not being an accident, uh, and I'm as you're speaking, as all of yours. First of all, first of all, folks, thank you. a big shout to my guests here for uh, just being wonderful and uh, helping me to look at these comments as they're coming in, trying to find the trying to pull out the questions. Uh, but this is uh, uh, something that I think we may have talked about before. But this is from Finn, uh, micrometeorites on the mirror contingency. Well, obviously the mirrors will be struck by micrometeorites, as the sun shield will, right? So what are the contingencies there? How do we go fix it? <laughs> go ahead, Patty. <laughs> 
hold on. I'm sorry. I lost my mute button there for a minute. Oh, okay. So, yep, there's stuff in space, and it hits, um, it hits space hardware. We actually have uh, returned instruments from Hubble, like uh, the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2, what we call WIF pic 2, uh, for a long time was sitting right out there in the Air and Space Museum uh, in Washington, D.C., and you could see evidence of, um, you know, small particles that had hit it over time that makes divots in there. Um, there's, again, contingencies for that. Um, you know, mirrors can still operate very well, even if they get little pricks from um, space dust out there. Uh, and also, you know, the, the sun shield is designed to, um, to be operational even with micrometeorite hits that would, would cause some damage to it. So all of this has been thought out very well. Um, there are all kinds of contingencies that can uh, continue to keep the spacecraft operational at a very high level, even with that environment. But another cool thing about um, L2 is that you don't necessarily get a lot of debris that, again, just naturally, stably builds up there. So it's, it's a pretty benign environment for space mm -hmm. debris compared to something like low Earth orbit, which we're so used to now with all the Starlink satellites going up and the movie Gravity. Right. And, uh, you know, L2 is very benign compared to where with Pic 2 on Hubble was located. Well, well, also in low Earth orbit, you're just that much deeper inside Earth's gravitational well. So you're just, you know, more stuff is falling in and, and moving faster. So that means not only is there more projectiles, or not projectile, but not only are there more moving bits of debris, but they're moving faster, which means that they can do more damage. Whereas L2, as you pointed out, is 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 benign. So yeah, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, now, ooh, here's one for Aaron, also followed by Super Chat. Thank you so much from P. Gupta, $5. Thank you very much. Early galaxy formation. What are the current foremost theories? What do models suggest? So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, Aaron, you know this one. Right, so I assume this is for galaxy, yes, early galaxy formation. Mm -hmm. So um, there are multiple parts playing in there. So we think the universe is filled with dark matter. That's how all the gravitational activities are governed by in the first place. So um, smaller dark matter halo form at earlier times. And then over time, they merge and they accrete what is in the universe to gradually form bigger and bigger halo. And over 13.8 billion years of time, we get to one that like just like the one that we live inside, which is an enormously massive. So um, this process is what we call a hierarchical structure formation, which is you know, small things form first, and then they come together and form bigger things. So um, we know roughly, well, very well how it works, but JWST will be able to help us to see some of the lower mass galaxies, the smaller ones at early times. So this will help us understand really the origin, the onset of galaxy formation. You know, in the past, we do see galaxies at redshift 10, which is very, very far away from us. But what we're picking up are the relatively massive galaxies. So we're thinking about galaxies that are maybe already at a hundredth or tenth of uh, the mass of our own Milky Way. But we still never get to the root of how they started. You know, the low mass galaxies that form, the first generation galaxies that form after the Big Bang. So we want to be able to capture that first scene and then see if that, um, you know, um, uh, align with what we think uh, in the general picture of galaxy formation. And then other really important picture is black hole. We think um, the early forming halos have black holes inside them. These are black hole seeds maybe left behind by the first stars. So the first generations of stars are very massive, bright and energetic, and they run out of gas, they burn out very quickly, and they left behind perhaps black hole seeds. So these seeds can also accrete mass from the halo, and they can merge when the halo merge, you know, there will be some spiraling, take some time, and then these seeds will merge and form supermassive black holes. So we are curious about how these supermassive black holes can gain mass so quickly and become luminous quasars that we observe at maybe redshift six or five, which is not as early as the first billion year of the universe's history, but maybe about one third or halfway through the universe's history. So we want to know um, where are these quasars coming from? Why are they gaining mass so quickly? So these are usually when we talk about AGN or quasars, we're thinking about the bulge of a galaxy. So there are these two parts, you know, how the bulge form and how the stars form in the disk. So this together is, is I think, two of the biggest unfully resolved problem in, um, in galaxy formation. Okay, great. And uh, there's a, so yeah, I mean, and this is actually one of the reasons, this is the original OG reason why Webb was built, 
right? It was to help us understand how galaxies formed in the early universe because Hubble, for all of its amaze, amazeness, uh, was, uh, you know, it's an optical telescope and, and those galaxies are so far away, their light is red shifted all the way into the infrared. So you can make Hubble twice as big and it's not going to see into the infrared. So you need an infrared telescope to be able to answer the very questions that uh, Aaron is trying to answer. So that's exciting. <laughs> that's really cool. Uh, we also had, uh, oh, just a few more questions coming in. I'm doing the best that I can to keep up with them, guys. Uh, but uh, this is more of a technical question uh, from uh, yapyap.com. How long will it take for web to transmit info back to Earth? Uh, as I understand it, not terribly long, correct? Well, right now it's over 600,000 miles away from the Earth, so it's about three seconds, three light seconds. Um, so I'm guessing it'll be five light seconds away when it's at L2. Well, that's not bad. And it uses the, it uses the Tedris satellite uh, network. The, um, there's oh, it, dishes oh, it on does. the ground. Oh, it does use Tedris. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, so, oh, maybe it's DSN. I'm sorry. I think it's, I think I'm it's DSN. Somebody else yeah. who, who knows comms should answer that question. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think DSN, it's DSN. Oh, excuse me a second. I've yeah. got someone joining here. Uh, let's see here. Once I can get, uh, once I can get our next you, guest you to, get, to yeah. come in. Well, actually, someone has just uh, signed in, but I don't see, I don't see them. Uh, it's okay. Now I see her. It's Heidi Hamill. Pardon me as I make a little switch around here. I'm going to try to bring on. Chris, I think we lost you, the audio. Okay, how about now? I'm back. And please welcome. You're back. Please welcome uh, our, our, our next guest here. Yeah, I know. This is this is like totally unprofessional. I'm supposed to be doing this behind the scenes, but screw it. It's Festivus. It's Web Deployment Day, and we hello. had to be joined by the incomparable Dr. Heidi Hamill. Heidi, hello. How's it going over there at Space Telescope Science Institute? It is really exciting here. It was just as exciting as launch, I have to say, um, to be. Um, I was in I just after ops, and uh, when things w when we latched and you know it was really exciting and wonderful so, so you you, you were in mission ops i was just outside mission ops but um not in mission ops because that they keep that you know protected and uh everyone is working hard in there but they have a conference room just outside mission ops and a bunch of us were in the conference room uh we're getting ready for the nasa press conference which has been delayed till 2 30 which is why i'm able to join you for oh. about 15 minutes oh well yeah. Good, good, because, you know, I mean, clearly uh, they they knew that we had pre-booked you and and that they finally recognized that, uh, oh, Launchpad Astronomy uh, needs Heidi. So they sent Heidi over, over here to, yeah, do, so to, do, to do this. <laughs> before we go over there, and, uh, you know, we're going to, first we're going to have the, our engineers talking about the amazing engineering feat that we have just accomplished, which yeah. is the full deployment yeah. Of the of the major structures, um, and then after that, then we're going to have another sub panel, which I'm part of, talking about looking forward, what's going to be happening in the coming months, what what and what science are we looking forward to, you know, when we start doing science uh, in the, the middle of the summer. Uh, I'm trying to do a little bit of a uh, patching around here. Yeah, that that's a terrible layout. I'm so sorry. If my uh I have a I have like a live streaming coach who's like taught me how to do this stuff. Uh, and uh, I, she would be so upset with me right now for this terrible layout. So I apologize. Uh, but uh, Heidi, we're, we're just we couldn't be happier that that you're with us. As a matter of fact, and and I don't know if I can bring all of us on the screen at once, but um, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, Heidi has been uh, with uh, not just the James. Well, she's been with the James Webb Space Hall. Yeah, the James Webb Project for a very long time. She's also been involved with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, even longer, obviously. And it's and the reason why I mention this is because uh, you know Heidi's uh, you know uh, she's like one of the OG greats of the Hubble Space Telescope. As a matter of fact, when uh, Hubble was you know being used way back in 1994, uh, it was uh, watching a 
a comet smash into Jupiter. Is that correct, Heidi? That's right. Yep. That was, uh, I was the team leader of the Hubble observations for Shoemaker-Levy 9 when it crashed into the planet Jupiter in 1994. And uh, so what a, what a great start to, to my introduction to space telescopes and continued using space telescopes um, ever since then. I've joined the Hubble, joined the James Webb Space Telescope project before, uh, you know, it was even a project. Um, I was just joking around with one of the scientists, Eric Smith, and we're trying to remember, you know, we're on the formal science working group. Yeah, there's me back when I was a young whippersnapper. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> the size of our, our monitors, they were the so monitors. huge back then. This, this uh, is... We were, we were seeing, uh, first fragments of, uh, we were seeing the first <laughs> impact site on Jupiter when the comet was uh, smashing into it. And we are really very excited about that. So yeah, we I started working on the web project though, um, before it was an e even a formal project, um, right. we had an ad hoc science working group and an interim science working group. And then finally in 2002, NASA sent out a call for proposals for scientists to join the formal science working group for, uh, for this telescope. And I was one of the six scientists selected for that. So uh, that was announced in 2003. Wow. So, you know, you can do the math. Uh, just for this one program, uh, I've been working on it for over 20 years when you roll in all the ad hocs and interims and pre-work. So well, to, to, to be at this stage now where we've gone from, you know, ideas and PowerPoint presentations and then bits of hardware and, and then it's all together and now it's in space, you know. It's, I know, how, how exciting is that? And, and wow, I mean, and, and to think, you know, I mean, to think that this has just is happening and that you got to kind of be in on the ground floor and you know i mean look i mean what were you like what were you five years old or something like that when this was happening i mean geez i mean this is just amazing what, what's that well, i'll share with you i was a young postdoc using the hubble space telescope for the first time and oh, really? that was your nothing to do with, with building it that was my first observations with the telescope and um it sort of uh, drove me to be thinking in this generational sense that um, I got to use that telescope had nothing to do with building it. It was on me to help build the next generation of space telescope so that now, you know, I see young whippersnappers on the screen and I know there's young whippersnappers listening. Um, this telescope is for you. <laughs> um, you know, I helped build it, but uh, you know, it's, like it's, it's now it's sent off and it's up to our science community all, all the uh the young and old out there to come up with fabulous ideas uh to use it uh, folks uh, i i just i just want to apologize really quick it looks like i had the audio muted during part of it and i and i do apologize uh hopefully you're hearing all of us uh now um yeah you know i i one of these days i'll to get a producer that can actually do what i'm trying to do behind the scenes but uh but Heidi, this this is just tremendously exciting uh you know i i'd ask a dumb question that they'd ask on tv like what's the mood right now but like obviously everyone just seems to be ecstatic like we got to see all of that happening uh right there live we carried the live stream and, and so forth so um you know where what do you think is uh the immediate what are the agenda items for the rest of the day, as far as you understand it, in the mock? Well, they will certainly be monitoring all the systems that are, are in place now. And the next major thing that, that has to start happening is we need to start moving the mirrors away from the framework on which they were launched, right? They were all kind of screwed into the framework, the back plane. And so um, that's going to be the next sort of thing that's going to be happening. Um, it's happening really going to be happening really slowly, though. These um, these things, as they move away into those deployable positions where we can actually start, you know, manipulating them to try to, to do the focusing of the telescope, they move, you know, I don't know. I don't remember the number exactly, but it was like the, like the speed that grass grows. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> slow. And, and so... Um, it, it's uh, things have been coming at a breakneck pace since we launched, um, and now things are going to start to slow down for a while. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to be having a, quite as much drama as we have had, which is good. It's all been good drama, uh, but it's going to slow down, and we're going to really focus now. The, now that the deploy, the major deployments are done, and now the attention turns to the mirror itself, the primary mirror. 
and getting all of those different segments aligned, working together. And that's a very slow, uh, methodical uh, process that is going to take a very long time. Uh, so Heidi, this is a question I'll, I'll, I'll field to you, uh, only because you, you are close to the mock, uh, but this also came in the form of a super chat, uh, from Andreas, who actually did not just one, but two super chats. So thank you very kindly. Uh, but, uh, how many single point of failures are, are, uh, retired by now? Like, has there been any, I don't want to say declaration of it, but any scuttlebutt, uh, from the mock about where we are in terms of the risk? So um, I don't have that number uh, to hand. I have yeah. seen um, that, well, hun that. Hundred, hundreds of single points of failures have been retired already. Yeah. Wonderful number, but we, we had hundreds. Um, but you know, I'll, basically here, here's what I'll share with you. Um, uh, until we are actually taking data yeah. you know, from L2 with a focused telescope, we're not done. Right. There are still going to be possibilities for failure. And so um, everybody, you know, we, we celebrate these moments when we're on the other side of a thing. But we have many, 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 many more steps to go in this process before we have a fully operational telescope with fully operational instruments. So I just, you know, we need to, to say that we're, we're not there yet. We have a telescope now, but now we need to focus the telescope. Oh, okay. And so, then once we so we need the, the telescope. telescope. So we need yeah. the telescope to actually work. Yeah, right. Oh. Now we've got light going through it now, but the <laughs> light is out of it's not in focus yet. It was designed that way, and oh, we didn't okay. we designed it that way um, because we can focus it in real time. That's what the whole process of the OTE optical telescope element commissioning is all about. And then after we've done all of that, you know, throughout that period of time, while we are focusing all these uh, 18 segments into one beautiful, crisp, uh, diffraction limited image, um, our, our instruments are cooling down. Um, and as they're slowly cooling down, and then once we're done with our optical telescope focusing, then we will work with the instruments and check out all of the modes of the different instruments, all of the imaging modes, the spectroscopic modes, the coronagraphic modes. Um, all of those things need to be checked out and verified to make sure all the pieces are working properly, uh, that we understand the sensitivities of all the different instruments. And then and only then, <laughs> months later, will we actually start doing science with the telescope. So we are months away from science this is this is a different kind of situation than the percy space as a percy rover on mars it landed on mars settled on its wheels opened the camera took a picture and sent it back that's not how this is working it's right. a different kind of uh heidi there's a question for you that came in the form of a super chat and i'm directing as many questions to you as you possible because i know that you've got to get to a press yeah. conference soon so uh but this I one did uh, okay yeah we have 11 minutes is that right okay uh, great. So P. Gupta, and thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, what was the countdown in thousands just before the final latch, 5,000, 4,000? Uh, you were close to the mock, so can you uh, shed any light on what those were about? I cannot. I'm sorry. I was in there and I heard them too, but I don't know what those thousands referred to. If, if some of your other um, panelists know that, um, I'm happy to punt that question over, but I, I don't know what those thousands were. Yeah, our, sorry. Our, our best guess was maybe it was... Uh, it might have been rotations, but I really don't know. I don't. I wouldn't imagine the latch motors would have been spinning that fast. But uh, yeah, okay. That, we were just wondering. But hey, yeah. you know, yeah. Go ahead, Aaron. Many of the motors uh, used in aerospace are what are called step motors. Hmm. That is to say, they count their movement by uh, incremental steps, and those oh. steps can be very small. And so thousands could happen in seconds. Oh, okay. So that's what that is. All right. So just basically going through the steps. And I know that the, uh, the the motors that will align the mirrors have to move in steps measured in measured in nanometers or tens of man nanometers. Is that right? Yeah. Well, and those are uh, piezoelectric motors uh, wow. as opposed to step motors. And uh, but they have sub micron uh, resolution. Yes. Uh, there's uh, some sub, sub nanometer, sub nanometer resolution. Yeah. Sub nanometer, smaller than that. How do you make that? I, I mean, that's, that's incredible. Uh, so, uh, well, actually the, let me, uh, I, I do want to kind of hop back to, uh, Heidi or 
Aaron or Patty for this one in particular, what useful data did you get out of Hubble that it wasn't originally designed to observe? Um, you know, obviously, uh, when Hubble was built, we didn't know there was going to be a comet crashing into Jupiter. So that was that was kind of cool. But were there other things that you got from Hubble that were real surprises? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I uh, my the first program I had actually planned to do with Hubble was a follow up to the Voyager mission, the Voyager Neptune flyby, which mm. I was one of the scientists for that. And, you know, we discovered this great dark spot on Neptune, and I was going to do follow-up with a great dark spot with the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, and so that's what I had proposed to do. The comet came in between, mm -hmm. but then in the fall of 94, I got my first Hubble images of Neptune, and I, the day they downloaded, I was like, I'm looking at them, and I'm like, there's no great dark spot. It had just completely disappeared. Yeah. And there I was. Yeah all these Hubble images and no dark spot to study. And that was a huge surprise because the great red spot in Jupiter had lasted for hundreds of years, right? Right. And so, and uh, the fellow down the hall for me, uh, Tim Dowling, he was a theoretical modeler and he had modeled the great dark spot. And, and that very afternoon, he came into my office and I was looking at these images like stunned. And he said, Heidi, Heidi, I've finally been able to model the great dark spot on Neptune. And I'm like, Tim, I have some bad news for you. <laughs> now you're going to have to model it going away. And he actually still to this day hasn't been able to do that. It's a lot easier to make dark spots oh, than it is man. to make dark spots. That was my surprising Hubble story. Um, so, that, yeah. that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a fun story. Uh, so, Patty or Aaron, do you have any uh, fun surprises that you got from Hubble? Well, I'll talk about exoplanets. I, I think yeah. that, you know, so Hubble was launched in 1990. And we hadn't even detected another planet beyond our own solar system, right? There's eight planets right. in our own solar system, which we're very familiar with, but we hadn't yet seen observational evidence that was confirmed of planets around other stars. That came in 1995. And then in 2000, the first transiting exoplanet was detected. So that's a planet that passes in front of its star, and the light dips, that's the transit, and that's how you can discover the planet. And soon afterwards, scientists realized that, well, when that transit is happening, if that planet has an atmosphere, some of that starlight is going to pass through the atmosphere and then hit our telescopes. And if we have enough light, we could be able to compare the spectrum of that star without the planet in front of it to the spectrum of that star with the planet in front of it. And that tiny little bit of the planet's atmosphere could imprint signatures on the different spectrum that would tell us what are the mm. components in that atmosphere. Does it have an atmosphere? Um, these were questions we weren't asking about exoplanets before Hubble was launched, or even like five, ten years into the mission. But scientists put their heads together and figured out, like, what kind of sensitivity do we need in these spectra, and can Hubble do it? And they came up with a way to use the existing instruments on Hubble, you know, the existing ways to collect data, to go after some of these systems and start to take spectra of atmospheres around other planets. So that's something Hubble was never designed to do. But, you know, scientists, engineers, and people who straddle those boundaries, astrophysicists who really understand how instruments work, um, you know, how, how telemetry works, how does the spacecraft and the instrument work together as a system that can go after these atmospheres. They worked very hard, and we're at the point where Hubble is routinely now observing Transiting exoplanets, looking mm. at the spec, looking for spectroscopic signatures of those atmospheres. Could wow. never have predicted that before launch. Uh, and what's gonna? What is? Where are we gonna take Webb in that direction? That's so exciting. Well, uh, this this actually leads into uh, flows into another question. This was asked by Devin, also uh, courtesy of a, of a super chat uh, from Devin, uh, and this is uh, directed to you, Heidi. Uh, what are you? Because uh, we were talking about this before. What are we most looking forward to? What are you most looking forward to with Webb? Yeah, that's like asking me which of my children I love the best. You know, I love them all. Um, which one has the most so, potential? Uh, well, they, they all have great potential as well. You know, great kids. Um, you know, there's. I'll answer this in two ways. Um, one is um, the overall science mission of James Webb Space Telescope. You know, the, the driving mission was to see the first light in the universe, the light from the first galaxies. And with a clever use of gravitational focusing, uh, maybe the, even some of the light from the first stars that ever formed. And that, when you think about that, when you think about the fact that we'll be able to do studies of the cosmos all the way back 
to the very beginning when stars are actually being born and galaxies are being born that and we'll be able to trace all that all the way through to the modern day to me that is remarkable and astonishing and i'm very excited about that core science that we have built this telescope to do on the other hand my science with Webb, um, I started working on this more than 20 years ago because, you know, I mentioned I worked on the Voyager project and to look at Uranus and Neptune, and we haven't gone back. Mm -hmm. Telescopes have been the only tool that I and my colleagues have had to study these planets um, since the Voyager missions in the 1980s. So I personally am really excited about the science that uh, we will get studying Uranus and Neptune with James Webb Space Telescope. We will learn a tremendous amount about the atmospheres, the stratospheres, the tropospheres, how they're connected, um, the dynamics, the chemistry, all of that will be coming from Webb observations. So, you know, that that's sort of the macro and then my, my own uh, you know, parochial uh, interest. And then, you know, the rest of my program, which is all the rest of the solar system, there's going to be great science throughout the solar system. Um, and I'm really excited about all of that as well. So, oh, that's big, so cool. uh, big, I've got a lot going on in my head. There's a lot of science that, that we're going to be doing with this telescope. It's going to be revolutionary. And, and really... Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was saying, it, it, it is, it's all about the science. That's why we're here. You know, it's why we went to this crazy extreme of building this extreme telescope and doing this extreme stuff with it. Uh, so how cool is that? Uh, Aaron, I know that you, uh, you probably. Yeah, I'm going I'm to say, I'm going to sign out now. And okay. thank you for inviting me, Christian. Great to thank see you, Aaron. Thank you for coming back, Heidi. Oh, it's so great to have you. Have a great yeah. presser, and we'll Bye, carry Heidi. that. We're going to carry that press conference uh, live here as well. So we're going to actually be seeing Heidi again soon in a slightly more official capacity. So thank you, Heidi. There she goes, Dr. Heidi Hamill. We're so thankful that you uh, that you could come and join us today. And uh, I'll go ahead and switch uh, switch back over here. We'll bring Aaron back up. There he is. And uh, how how cool is that? So. Uh, and, and thanks to my other guests for, thanks to everybody uh, on our panel here for uh, being patient. Heidi was kind of like hop in, hop out. And uh, like I said, she was originally going to be on even more. And then NASA says, hey, we want you in the press conference. So here we are. Uh, let's talk about some other, let's go ahead and uh, do you guys want to do a few more questions? We got just a. Well, there's one surprise with Hubble that we didn't get to. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, um, the Hubble Deep Field. Oh, my goodness. Well, yeah, it was launched in 1998. Yeah, we have to talk about the Hubble Deep Field because um, it is really our first time seeing the edge of the universe. Well, things form very far away from us, galaxies forming in the early history of the universe. So for those of you who have not heard about it, you can quickly Google that. It's called the Hubble Deep Field. It was an image taken in 1995 that um, the director at the time used his discretionary time to point the telescope to a blank patch of the sky. You know, this the idea is sort of like you're given a race car and you want to test out how fast it can go. So you just go to the gas pedal, floor it, basically. So we point Hubble to a patch of the sky that don't have any bright objects, like a star, like a, a galaxy near us. Great, there it is. Well, this, so is, this is the original. The picture of it. I was say, this is the original uh, Hubble deep field. There there were others that were that were taken uh, so there's the field around the Hubble deep field and uh, that notched out uh, diagram that you see that is the field of view of the uh, of the not the original but the second camera and saw in the Hubble the wide field planetary camera too this is the instrument that I was uh, involved with when I worked on the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, so anyway um, they pointed with pic 2 at this patch of sky here are some of the details from that original image but there is an even deeper field that they went ahead and did called the ultra deep field. Let me see if I could find that one. Uh, there we are, the Hubble ultra deep field. Going to bring that up. And uh, Aaron, uh, tell us, tell us, tell us what happened. What's going on here? Yeah, so over the year, there are several patches of the sky has been surveyed over and over again. So, so this is like a wedding cake structure. So you have the Hubble deep field that sets kind of like a stage. And then after that, there is the candles survey headed by uh, Sandy Faber. So one of the field, the Goots North, whatever that stands for, <laughs> it's uh, actually within the Hubble Deep Field. 
And that is going deeper and seeing more objects in there. And within that, there is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field that spent even more time doing longer exposures on a smaller patch of the sky. And really in the tiny little square, uh, you know, a fraction of the size of the moon in that patch of the sky, you have 10,000 galaxies in there. And some of them goes all the way out to Redshift 10. And to put that into perspective, that is really in, within, well within the first 10% of the universe's history. So we are already seeing objects from that far away. So wow. you see, this is um, in line with general how astronomical surveys are done. We start with a bigger, bigger field to get ourselves oriented with where the objects are, where the bright stuff are. But then we gradually shrink in size, but spend more time on a smaller patch of the sky trying to image deeper and deeper. So let me just quickly add that um, within the cycle one, what you mean the first year of GWST's operation, there is a program called NG Deep. So the next generation deep extra galactic extra, uh, 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 well, well, uh, it's hey. a public survey. So it's called ah. NG Deep. Okay. And we are going to revisit the um, Hubble Ultra Deep field and try to use web to take even deeper image of the field. We're going to spend 120 wow. hours of it. So wow. to fill um, that field with um, both images with near cam, the infrared camera, but also with near spec, the near in infrared spectrograph uh, uh, instrument. So we are going to get spectroscopic confirmation for the galaxy candidates in that field, but also fill the field in, you know, fill in with more infrared information that we didn't used to have with Hubble images. Uh, and I hope. Uh... P, uh, P. Phoebe, we answered your super chat question. Thank you very, very much for for offering that. And uh, oh yeah, David has a has a really good idea. If you have a question, try uh, try putting a Q colon in front of it. Uh, that hopefully can help me and and our moderators to find those a little bit faster and and gather them up. But uh, but thank you, uh, David, for that wonderful suggestion. Uh, there was another. Uh, so there, there was another uh, question that um, came through, and I think I highlighted here. Uh, but uh, uh, well, there's lots of questions. I mean, I want to, but I wanted to kind of. Oh, actually, let me let me just uh, quickly answer just a couple of these. Uh, to uh, Nguyen asked, "Can I make a video of how the instruments work?" Yes, uh, that's actually a video that I have planned. Um, my next video about web will be about how the optical system works, uh, getting all the gory, nerdy details about that. Bert, I need your help writing that script. Uh, and then um, and then I'm going to be talking about the instrumentation, Patty, uh, Aaron, uh, and uh, so we'll be talking about that. Uh, so those are videos that are coming down the pipe. And by the way, I do apologize. Uh, I, my channel is Launchpad Astronomy, not Launchpad James Webb. I will be talking about, uh, you know, the other astronomy, but this is just too exciting. Now, uh, this uh, funnels into another question that uh, came in, uh, and I've seen this a few times, but how is it determined who gets to use the telescope and, and when? Is it voted on by committee? Can astronomers with a valid reason apply? Can anybody, uh, any schmo, uh, send in a proposal? Uh, so, uh, Pat Patty, I think you've been involved in a few time allocation committees mm -hmm. in your days. <laughs> A few, a few. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, the time is all open for um, the community. So, it, But in this first year, there are three categories for observing times. One is called guaranteed time observing. So that is where the scientists who have spent, like Heidi was just describing, 20 years or more of their careers designing these instruments, doing simulations, working through integration tests, commissioning plans. Those teams get some of the time in the very early days to do observations that they've been planning to do. So that's called the guaranteed time observations. There were also um, several um, programs that were um, requ requested from the community called early release programs. And so what these are all about is they will all be immediately public. So the data will be public to the teams and to the community of astronomers that weren't on those teams and anybody else all at the same time. Um, they cover very broad areas. So there's like an active galaxy one. There's an exoplanet transmission spectroscopy, but also direct imaging. There's star formation ones. They're all meant to collect the data that really exercises each one of these instruments modes and allows the community to work with them early on with the software and with their, with their own packages. How, did, how are they going to get results from these early release observations that are going to help them write the proposals for the future? 
So, and then of course there's the cycle one observations. Those are the guest observer observations. And that's every year that the Space Telescope Science Institute will request proposals. They come in for all space telescopes, including Hubble, tests, all the ones you've heard about. Um, there's a few months where the scientists can get together and form teams and propose their ideas for what they want to do with the telescope. And we always get many times more great proposals than we can ever spend observing time on. Yeah. So a panel of reviewers come together. Um, more and more what we're seeing is that these are dual anonymous, which means that the reviewers don't see the names of the teams or the institutions that they came from. They just read the science case. And the scientists who put the proposals in don't know who's reviewing it, so that's why it's called dual anonymous. And those peer review pa panels, they work together in their own little panels. They come up with the most compelling science cases in their panel, and then they all get together and they make a overall observing program for that observatory for the next year based on the most exciting proposals that they saw and the most unique proposals. So that's how the time gets allocated. Um, each team has the you know, has a bit of proprietary time where they can work on the data themselves before it goes public. Uh, teams can choose to waive their proprietary rights to the data, and many missions, the newer missions, are actually have no proprietary rights. So when the data comes down and is hitting in archives, when the team gets it, the entire worldwide community can get it as well. So professional astronomers can jump on it the minute it comes down, but also there's a huge number of citizen science programs out there where professional scientists work together with interested folks in the community um, to go through these data sets together and come up with fundamentally new discoveries. So there's all kinds of ways to get involved. That's fantastic. Uh, and uh, someone was also asking about uh, where does one go to get the data uh, afterward? Uh, well, I know that there's a, there's a number of different ways that the data gets out. First of all, all of the data eventually is made public. Uh, is that correct, uh, Aaron? Is that how you understand how the data release works? Yeah, so um, as long as they're public, I think they will be released through the Mikulski archives uh, for Space Telescope. So that is um, the must, sometimes, uh, MAST, we sometimes call it. So um, basically everyone can go on and grab them. And I would add that as a member of the early release science team, we actually come with some commitment that we have to provide the data reduction pipeline. So, you know, if I give you a JWST image, like say a filter image with ones and zeros, which pixel get turned on, that is not very helpful. So there are actually several steps from the observations to science. Basically, how do we uh, assign a color to the pixel? Is it a detection or is it just noise? But also um, after that, how do we identify an object, which pixels get grouped together and count as a galaxy, or how do we de-blend them when two of them are you know, stacked on top of each other, all these kind of nitty gritty details. So um, the data, the raw data will be available pretty much as uh, Patty said earlier, mm -hmm. uh, available as long as the team has waived their proprietary time. But we also provide some data reduction tools, let's say Python notebooks, that you can run on this data to get to um, the desirable result. And I, I also uh, should just maybe add to that. Um, you mentioned a proprietary, a proprietary period. Obviously, if you put in all the hard work to get time on any telescope, be it Hubble, Webb, uh, anything, you deserve a little bit of time to actually analyze your data so that somebody doesn't come along and scoop you, right? You know, and say, ooh, I just discovered this thing going on in this galaxy, thanks to Aaron's data that I, you know, and but at the same time, though, you get, I think, like a year and a day to do your analysis and publish your work. Because after that year and one day is over, guess what? The data is public. You don't get to hoard that data forever. Uh, that data becomes uh, public domain. So, yeah, uh, you all want to get your data? Uh, if you want to see the raw, unprocessed data, uh, you know, to know what it really looks like which is just to say the unprocessed data yeah go ahead down download it here uh run your own filters on it make it uh interpret it the way you wish to interpret it and you're good to go uh let's see um so uh okay another question here uh okay uh how many plants have festivus uh <laughs> i think okay uh let me uh <laughs> i don't know i think we do let me find another one here really quick. Uh, I know that we, and I apologize, folks. I'm trying to scrum through these questions as best as I can. But there was one other question uh, that I'd like to come back to, actually a bajillion other questions. Uh, and that is, uh, 
you know, why have we not used the space shuttle for Webb's launch? Uh, I think the answer to there is, is relatively straightforward because, you know, the shuttle has been retired from service since 2011. Uh, but then uh, there's another question about can SpaceX make the next telescope? I don't think that SpaceX manufactures telescopes, correct? No. But they sure do provide great launches. They do. They do launch, so yeah. The, the TESS Observatory was launched on a SpaceX Falcon 9. That was the first astrophysics uh, SpaceX launch, but it was great and fun, and they're launching more and more um, astrophysics payloads as time goes on. And we were talking about that Great a little bit earlier. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier, about how, you know, uh, with uh, their their Falcon Heavy and with the Starship, uh, yeah, the Starship's going to have a nine meter fairing. It could easily launch a larger hardware into space for us. Uh, let's see. Um, so there was this uh, question about, uh, can we please get to the question again about how uh, the capability of web to be serviced in the future? Uh, so, Bert, uh, you know, let's uh, go service web. What's the, what are the chances of that happening? Um, I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know that it has no gas cap. So you oh. can't just send up you can't just send up a, a, a gas mobile rocket and refuel it. OK. Um, that would that would take uh, actually uh, a very complicated procedure to try to actually you know refuel something that doesn't have a gas cap, <laughs> right? Um, or you know the question of servicing again that would be a uh, robotics mission that would have to go up with certain equipment to be able to perform certain servicing tasks. And now let's say Hubble, uh, not Hubble, James Webb is up there 15 years working, and and then it's you know time to shut it down, you know. We would have to start planning the missions somewhat in the near future to be able to go and actually do that. Um, NASA does do some great robotics servicing um, missions that they have planned, for example, to go refuel Landsat 7, which does not have a gas cap either. And so is it within the technological possibilities? Yes. Is there any plans to do so now? No. So. It's, it's that's definitely a question of we'll see when we see yeah um physically it's not impossible uh and we've refueled quote unrefuelable or we are planning to refuel unrefuelable spacecraft uh anyway so it's possible just i guess it's just going to ultimately come down to what it's going to ultimately come down to whether or not it'd be worthwhile to do right i mean is there a argument to be made patty do you want to uh, comment on that or I was going to say, like, like Bert is saying, it would take a, quite an effort to plan something like that. It would be, uh, you know, going through a t very complicated execution like we've watched over the last two weeks. It would be more of the same. So it would cost money. It would take time. It would be high risk. And there would be a trade-off. Is it, is it m more valuable to spend the time refueling web? Or would we put our funds into something where we could launch the next generation of technology and ultra-stable telescopes uh, to get out to, say, L2 or you know, a similar orbit um, to get better science. So I think it would be, there would be a trade-off. It's not just a linear Q&A kind of thing. These fixed points are also really interesting for the commercial space uh, program. So, you know, you can put things at L1 and L2 and, um, you know, you could imagine that the commercial space agency would like to try things out at L2 and, and L1. Mm. Uh, they may have reasons to do that um, independent of Webb, and if, you know, Webb is in a situation where it could use some help, they could say, hey, maybe you could let me try something on Webb, and you could imagine a, you know, collaboration forming that way. But as far as, um, you know, what Bert said is correct, there's no plans right now um, to refuel Webb, either robotically or in any other way. Well, we'll keep hoping. Uh, by the way, I just, uh, just let you guys know, I'm st we're still waiting on the, uh, nope, that's not it. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're still waiting on the press conference to begin uh, down at Space Telescope Science Institute, so we'll go ahead and just keep working through a few more questions here. Uh, this is probably uh, a, you know, well, another related question, if not maybe servicing web, could we, uh, let's say, upgrade it, uh, adding uh, additional mirrors on separate craft? Or, okay, would it be better to build a telescope out of multiple spacecraft, each with its own mirror, and combine them like so? I think that's actually something that's been studied or has been considered, right? Space interferometry. Uh, so yeah, go ahead, Bert. Right. 
Good. Yeah, you you can have uh, multiple apertures, uh, which in this case, the way the question is being asked, being multiple uh, spacecraft, uh, act as a single telescope where you combine the beams interferometrically. Um, you you could do it if you had uh, the timing uh, clocks that were fast enough to measure uh, phases of the wavelength of light, but we don't have clocks that fast yet, hmm. um, at least to be able to synchronize between uh, collecting different data and, and to do that, uh, you know, with a computer later. But, uh, you know, in, in theory, I've seen uh, the, you know, people have proposed, uh, you know, you'll see many concepts out there, uh, you know, if you for interferometric um, space telescope type structures uh, to get high resolution uh, imagery. Uh, I just got the notification that uh, NASA is officially, uh, well, NASA's timer has stopped counting down. We're still waiting uh, for the uh, for the presser to begin, but okay, great. So yeah, this, this all comes down to just synchronizing clocks. I'm going to say just comes down to it's an extremely difficult thing to do at, at those ultra tiny time scales. Uh, let's see, another super chat. Wow, this is, thank you. So and Nancy uh, Shogger. So, Christian, I do see the press conference starting. Are you going to? Yep. Uh, so I've got a let me uh, let me refresh here. Make sure I've got a live. Yep. Here we are. We have still have about five and a half months of commissioning left, but these last two weeks have truly been amazing. Today represents the beginning of a journey for this incredible machine. To, to its discoveries that it will be making in the future. Um, JVST itself is an amazing mission, and thousands and thousands of people have worked on it, and I can never thank them all enough, every individual one, for the contributions that they have made to getting us to today. This journey has been really remarkable. Um, the successes over the last two weeks is truly a tribute to the people of, this, of the JVST program. Their diligence and passion for JVST is second to none. And personally, if you heard I'm on Sorry about that. the voice loops earlier, I am truly, and I have to repeat them here, I am honored and humbled every day to be working with this team. And I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, I've lost my picture and picture capability, so I'm trying to. Uh, it will be questions, and we can have our operator step in and give uh, information how to get on the queue, and uh, tell us Certainly. who the first question is from. Thanks. Certainly, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one. Our first question today is from Bill Harwood from CBS News. Okay, pardon me as I adjust this. There we are. Bill Harwood, your line is open. Hey, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, for Bill Ock, you know, you told us before launch you were 100% confident all the deploys would work exactly as planned. And I remember thinking at the time you were inking it, but uh, that clearly wasn't the case. So how big of an engineering challenge was all this? Was it as easy as it looked? Or was it really as difficult as we had all been led to believe? Because it sure seemed to go smoothly. Thank you. <laughs> It's not as easy as it looks, but the easiness that you saw, again, like I mentioned earlier, is just a tribute to the folks. Um, we went through I, what I feel now is the exact right amount of testing, the exact right of amount of engineering audits, the exact right amount of tweaks to the design as we've gone through this journey of, of manufacturing and then launching this, this telescope. The fact that it looked easy just it just show just emphasizes that we did all the right things leading up to this moment. I hope you guys can hear that okay. Uh, it's for some reason. Uh, Our next question is from Elizabeth Howell. From it's a little bit quiet uh, coming through, and I've uh, got. This one is also for Bill. I've got it cranked. Um, I've got the browser a cranked. How the teams are feeling? How the teams are doing? I know that it's been a very busy couple of weeks since the launch, and over obviously usually a very busy time for folks anyway. So. How's everyone doing? Everyone is doing excellent. I think everyone is extraordinarily excited at this point. Um, I don't think there was one point during the, the entire last two weeks, and even the 
the period leading up to launch down at the launch site where anybody felt down, slowed down. I mean, we're all we're all a little tired, but besides that, um, we are on an incredible high right now. Thank you. Our next question is from Jeff Faust, Space News. Uh, good afternoon, and congratulations on the successful deployment. Uh, I just wanted to confirm, we heard a lot about leading up to the launch about these 344 single-point failures. At this point, have all of those been retired, and if not, what might be left that would be associated with other aspects of the spacecraft? Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Mike Menzel. I'm the mission systems engineer, and there are 49 single-point failures out of the original 344 that are not retired and will not be retired for the, uh, for the duration of the mission. These 49 are typical of all missions, things like propulsion tanks, things like that. And of those 49, 15 are associated with the instruments, which means if any one of them went, such as a filter wheel failing, we would not fail the mission. We would just fail one of the science objectives associated with that. Thank you. Our next question is from Robert Perlman, Collect Space. Hi. Um, congratulations on the deployment. I think for Mike, um, given that there were no cameras to send back images, is there anything for which you didn't have telemetry to now say that the telescope looks exactly like the artist renderings or the computer animations or even the engineering tests we saw here on Earth? Well, there are a couple of minor things that aren't telemetered, but uh, whereas if we don't have what we call primary telemetry, we have secondary telemetry. And that secondary telemetry gives us verification that what we think is going on really is going on. So in reality, given the secondary and primary telemetry points that we have, the configuration of the observatory that we are we're demonstrating or that we're illustrating is pretty accurate right now. So I would I would say that you know, whereas we might be missing certain primary telemetry on some certain items, the secondary telemetry that we have really confirms that our configuration is as we're showing it. Thank you. Our next question is from Marina Corin from The Atlantic. Hi, everyone. Congratulations. Uh, two questions for Mike and Scott. Are you of you almost the deployment sequence uh, went as well as it did? Were you bracing for a more difficult deployment given how risky and complicated you expected this process to be? Uh, and the second question, were there any issues that came up during the deployment that you haven't told us about yet? Thanks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Mike answer the second question. Um, you actually answered the first question in your question, which is, we worried about it on the ground. What we focused on was, you know, design, test, verification, and if need be, redesign and retest and re-verification. So our entire objective was ring this out on the ground so that when we went into space and we follow that timeline, we did expect that it would go right. Maybe we'd see something new, we'd see a behavior of, you know, sun angle or how the thermal was or how certain things call it confessed to us, but the reality was, Everything we did to wring our hands on the ground and have those sleepless nights led to a, a wonderful last 16 days. <laughs> okay, so is there, is there anything that we didn't tell you? I doubt that seriously. There, there's always a couple of you know minor alarms that go off that's really more like a, a housekeeping than anything else. But other than that, I think you're aware, you're aware of, the, uh, of the incidents or the anomalies that have occurred. And most of them, by, by the way, were very minor compared to the ones we practice in our rehearsals. Thank you. Our next question is from Jim Siegel from NASA Tech. Uh, thank you for taking my question and congratulations to the entire team. Uh, I noticed uh, in looking at the uh, photos and pictures, uh, the video that was on the screen that there were a number of people in the uh, Michigan Michigan Operation Center, and I assume that there were others and other buildings or other rooms within the uh, the, the uh, building. And I'm interested in uh, roughly 
How many people were in the mission operations room during that uh, that deployment, and how many other people, um, perhaps around the world, were also involved in the deployment that we saw today? So um, we run in the entire Mission Ops Center. So it's not just the one room, but in this section of the building that we consider the Mission Ops Center, we run 95 people for shift for deployment operations. As far as around the world, the other folks that were involved were actually out at north of Grumman in the factory, and they provided support, in, in particular during the uh, SunShield deployment where we had a our independent verification, essentially engineering model, full-scale engineering model, all set up, and it went through every step of the deployment with us so if we would have had a problem, we would have been able to go back and look at that. This helped determine what the issue might have been. Thank you. Our next question is from Marsha Dunn from Associated Press. Hello. Um, question for you, Bill. I'm, I'm wondering if you think it's all downhill from here. The first two weeks were obviously risky, complicated, never before attempted. Um, if it was summiting Mount Everest, landing on Mars, how do you view the uh, rest of the um, mission, actually? And does the team get a rest, or are you going to be moving immediately into the um, alignment of the 18 mirror segments? Thanks. Um, it's not downhill from here. <laughs> it's all kind of a level playing field. Um, obviously, with the, like Mike talked about, the single point failures associated with deployments, um, that was probably the highest risk part of the mission. That doesn't mean all our risk goes away, and doesn't mean we lose our intensity as far as uh, maintaining our discipline for the mission. Um, you'll actually get more information about what comes next, um, but we, what we do next is we take the, each of the individual mirror segments and we deploy them off of their uh, launch stowed position. Thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, I want more to follow up on an earlier question um, about making it look easy. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk before the mission about this being perhaps the most complicated spacecraft deployment in history uh, in space. Um, you know, you did make it look easy. It was uh, uh, nearly perfect. And uh, just wondering, in retrospect, you know, how would you rank this deployment process up against anything else that's been done in history? And um, uh, just if you could take like an like an after action look back on, was it really as complicated as you said it was before the mission? Thanks. I'll take a part and let Mike go, but there's really two aspects. One is the practice that we did on the ground, but this was our fourth SunShield deployment. So we did one as we integrated on the vehicle, and then we did one at what's called the observatory level. After the optics were integrated with the bus and the SunShield, we did one before an environmental test and one after. So this is our fourth shot at it, and we learned in each of those successive, pretty clean one on number three, which ver verified that we worked after surviving a simulated rocket ride. But the other thing is you design for worst case. You design sometimes for worst, worst case. So within our design, we always had margin to go to. We had more motor power if we needed to drive it out. We had more strength in something if we needed to pull on it harder or push on it harder. So you build in that because knowing surviving the first days and the first weeks often is the most stressing environment that a satellite goes through. This is why they tend to last, you know, well beyond their, their initial, you know, intended mission life. So, so you don't over-design, but you design for things that you can't always test. So, so analytically, you make things worst case. On the ground, you push harder, you go colder, you go hotter. And you do all of that stuff on the ground so that you swim right in the middle of the lane after your launch. So it's really a combination of that and practice. Yeah, and um, in one of the other press conferences, I pointed out that when it comes to the deployments of this observatory, there are two kind of unique things about the deployments. First was a sun shield, and that was deploying large, indeterministic, floppity structure with a lot of cables, a lot of, you know, tennis court-sized membranes that could float to places you don't want them to float to in zero-G. 
And, you know, through our testing and through our design, we controlled that. And Northrop and uh, the SunShield team did a great job on that. The second part of our deployments are what I call precision deployments. This, we're actually, you know, rebuilding and retuning an optical and infrared telescope remotely. And those deployments had to happen such that they position the mirrors accurately enough so that our wavefront sensing and control optical engineers can start taking that, that state where they're in and tune a telescope. So between the fact that we had large indeterministic deployments like the Sun Shield, and then we had large precision deployments like in the OTE, like in the telescope, this has been a, you know, arguably the most challenging deployment program ever done by NASA. Thank you. Our next question is from David Curley from the Discovery Channel. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill, if I could get you to come back up one more time. You know, we've heard this through uh, this process over the last couple of months, that great confidence, but we had sleepless nights. I get that, but and I do hear relief in your voice, especially to the answer to the first question. Can you just talk about that? And then the bigger picture of the science when the first image from all the mirrors, uh, once they've been all set, comes back and what, what all this work has meant and should mean. Um, as far as relief goes, yes. I mean, there's obviously a huge <laughs> feeling of relief. Um, a couple of times people have made comments about the easiness of the deployments. Just because we made it look easy doesn't mean it was easy. Um, but it is, like I mentioned earlier, just a, a tribute to everyone who's worked on this to uh, get us through it. But yes, there was a huge sigh of relief. I think you could see that if you watched the, uh, the video of us being in there today when that final mirror got latched and the folks in the back room were doing the wave, we're all up giving each other high fives. So that's all of a sign of relief. As far as the first science goes, um, there will be a couple of science folks on the next panel. They can discuss that. Um, but obviously, we are all looking forward to that time when they release those first images and first spectrographs and spectrum and really talk about some of the amazing discoveries that we'll be making and demonstrating that we'll be making with JVST. Let them know how you feel, Nancy. <laughs> you called out all the insurance. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So part of, um, I think, making it look easy was um, we developed all our procedures very early. We were um, using them back in panel integration. We used them through INT. We tested as much flight-like as we could from day one. And so by the time we went through rehearsals and got here, everyone who was supporting was very familiar with what all the procedures did, how they work, and what to expect you know, in terms of data return. So we were lucky to some extent, smart to some extent, but everything, you know, was just very smooth and, you know, very predictable. So it's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Our next question is from Reese Nations from the Well News, Washington, D.C. Hey, uh, thanks for the call, everyone. It's a pleasure to be hearing your voices today. Congratulations on the successful mission. Um, I just wanted to ask real quickly uh, about the November payload processing incident where a client band broke. How close did that come to damaging the uh, the vehicle, and how would that complicate the efforts from there going forward? It seems that you guys touched on that earlier a little bit. Everything is going smoothly, but uh, was that cutting it a little close there for your for your liking? Um, so, yeah, I think you were talking about the clamp band incident down at the launch site. Um, there was no damage to the spacecraft. Um, we've proved that. we proved that down at the launch site through our testing that we've done. We did some specific testing as well as running the liveness test. We've done a boatload of analysis to determine that the shock event that we saw did no damage to the spacecraft, and we've demonstrated that today from a standpoint of deployments. Um, so I hope that, that answers your question. Thank you. Our next question is from Leo Enright from Irish Television. Thanks very much for doing this, and congratulations. Um, the administrator a few minutes ago uh, on NASA TV made a passing reference uh, to a, an L2 insertion burn uh, that he pointed out was of some importance. 
Could you talk a little bit about that? In particular, I'm thinking, I'm looking as I'm talking to you at the cruising speed, which just fell to 395 metres a second. I mean, you're not going much faster than a 747 jet at the moment. Uh, and I'm just wondering, I mean, what speed are you going to be doing when you get up the hill to L2? Uh, and is there anything that really worries you about that burn? Or are you comfortable that you've already had enough burns? Hey, we uh, know the answer to this to question. Put that risk <laughs> to one side. Yeah, the, uh, the burn you're referring to is uh, what we call the MCC2 burn. And to be honest with you, we're not at all worried about it. It's a very minor burn. I don't actually have the Delta V at, at, you know, uh, available right now, but uh, it's a very minor burn. It would be done at about launch plus 29 days. And uh, after that burn, we pretty much actually fall into the orbit around the L2 point. So we do have to do the burn, but in terms of its timing and in terms of its delta V, compared to some of the other burns we've already successfully um, accomplished and uh, you know and implemented, this isn't all that critical. So you know, and uh, we're not that worried about this burn at all. Thank you. Our next question is from Marcia Smith, SpacePolicyOnline.com. Thanks so much. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing from the Northrop Grumman representatives how this all looks from their standpoint. It's been a long haul to get James Webb built and uh, probably many more years than Northrop Grumman had planned. So I'm curious about how it looks from a corporate perspective and what lessons you may have learned on this program that can be applicable to others. And I'm also curious about the visualization tool that NASA has been showing and which has been very, very helpful. And I'm curious, is that something Northrop Grumman developed or where did that come from? And uh, my last question is, what is Northrop Grumman's role going forward? Are you going to be involved in operations from here on or is your job pretty much done? Um, let me address a little and have uh, Vince come up. The one thing that made this special for us is as Northrop as an industry uh, player works with NASA, it's different than most of our customers because NASA designs and builds and tests things. So we're going to their shop at Goddard and we're watching hardware get built and tested on shaker tables or at Johnson as we're building. So, so you know, when you talk about, I'll call it a lesson learned, but certainly what we learned to do was collaborate at an engineering level. That's how you make something. There's no way any one company could have done the James Webb Space Telescope. So as a as a company working joint with NASA, as we had back on the Chandra X-ray telescope and the Compton Gamma Ray telescope, we have decades of experience of building things together, which sometimes can create tension, but you hope it's a healthy tension as engineers debate, and that brings out the best of you. And then it's, you know, okay, what we agree to, and, and Bill and I will often broker that for the teams, and then go focus on it and get it done. So, so I think that, that, that relationship, you know, got perfected over the years. Um, you know, from a lessons learned perspective, I always look at the management perspective, what does it take to manage something this big, this complex? How do you make risk-based decisions? There isn't a meeting we usually walked out of where we just focused on plan A, where we didn't say, where is plan B? Where were we going to be ready if we had to make a different, you know, if something, the result doesn't come out? We don't want to run a test before knowing what to expect as the results, so we're not reacting after the fact, we're preparing before the fact. And that's where we brought the best out of each other. Um, I'll let you know, uh, Mike or, or Bill talk about the visualization tool, but in terms of the future, we are part of the operations. We have a test bed. We have an electrical test bed also, in addition to a mechanical test bed that we'll have up and running. If there's software patches, if there's questions on orbit, we'll run those back. You don't want to do something for a first time in a vehicle. You don't have to do, um, so we'll demonstrate that. I'm going to add a little Vince. Yeah, I would just say, you know, certainly there's a lot of lessons learned from an INT perspective, which is really my most of my background. It, it was incredibly complex. I mean, just for us to for the IVA that Bill was talking about back at the factory, it took that team 45 days to fold it back up and stow it so that we could deploy as we watched the deployments here live. And then when you look at, you know, you look at the sun shield and everybody's asking, is it really that complicated? If if you look at the guts of that, right? It's feet and feet of cables and pulleys and dog houses and clips, all this stuff that has to work perfect. I mean, are you kidding me? It, it is complex, 
but it's a tribute to the technicians and engineers that last touched the satellite at Space Park. They just diligently made sure that everything they did was going to be perfect. And that's why we just had the best deployment of the sun shield that we've had in the four times that we've done it. So uh, congratulations to those guys. Thank you. Our the, next question. The visualization tool is actually part. I apologize. Yeah, the visualization tool is actually part of the ground system. Uh, it was provided by Raytheon out of Denver. Um, and basically it's made up of our various um, drawings of the telescope that we've taken and converted, they convert into an animation. But the whole thing is driven by telemetry from the spacecraft, such that as, as the configuration changed on the spacecraft, we could see it change on the ground. Thank you. Our next question is from Alicia Sowers from Mashable. Hi, thank you uh, for taking my questions. Congratulations. Um, the observatory hasn't reached its destination yet, and all of these deployments have occurred while Webb is traveling um, to L2. So uh, I'm just kind of wondering, is there any risk that the structures could be damaged or come out of alignment as it continues um, toward its destination? And the other thing I wanted to ask was, um, you know, you've got a really large audience right now on the edge of their seats uh, for web, and I'm just wondering, you know, there's a long time between now and June when we're going to see those images. Um, I'm wondering if there are any uh, upcoming milestones that uh, people can look forward to in the meantime. Thank you. First, there, there, are no, there are no dangers to the, to the structure by virtue of where we are in the orbit. Where we are in the orbit right now is a very benign, a very benign trajectory. And as I said before, we're literally, after the MCC2, we'll literally fall into orbit around the L2 point. And then for the other, the other question was, um, uh, what's, coming up? Oh, what's coming up? You'll hear that on the, uh, that's a better question for the next panel coming up. Thank you. Our next question is from Irene Klotz, Aviation Week. Good afternoon. Um, for Northrop Grumman, uh, probably Mr. Willoughby, does the deployment uh, complete a, uh, the JWST primary contract and then you switch over to this technical support, um, or is it all still part of the same contract, or did that initial contract uh, complete when the telescope was uh, turned over to NASA? So our primary contract goes to launch plus one year. We did have, Bill and I, a signing party down at the launch base when we do what's called the DD-250, so that transfer of ownership of the vehicle, because we had a, you know, as we completed out putting, the, you know, final MLI and parts on the vehicle. So, but with that, that's still under our prime contract. So as in terms of that responsibility, certainly commissioning for the next six months and six months of science missions, and then we'll transition to what's called the phase and to the O&M part of it. Thank you. Our next question is from Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. Hi, thank you for doing this, taking my question, and congratulations on the uh, spectacular success there. Um, my question is about uh, lessons learned. You, you've accomplished this great deployment. What, what are the lessons learned going forward, and how would you apply this to larger, larger deployable telescopes. I wonder if you could uh, speculate what, what is possible beyond web now that you have uh, accomplished this. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, well, well in, in terms of lessons learned, we're compiling that, a lot of us are compiling that now. I think it's a little too premature for me to, to comment on that, honestly. Uh, our deployments went so smooth, you know, uh, it would be hard right now to have some obvious lessons learned from that. We'd probably, uh, you know, when I caucus with the engineering teams and we start compiling our lessons learned, it might be some of the telemetries that we found a little funny, maybe some uh, telemetry extra secondary proceeds, uh, secondary telemetry procedures that we might want to do, things like that. So right now, it, the honest answer would be too uh, too early for me to give you some some real definitive lessons learned from this. But overall, it went smoothly, and, uh, you know, I think the lessons learned would be something along the lines of uh, 
hey, uh, here's how we should plan contingencies. Here's how we should, uh, uh, you know, uh, provide other telemetry points, things like that. I'd like to add a little bit, you talk about what's next. We proved that we could build a telescope bigger than the top of the rocket, right? I mean, something that had to be folded, the optics itself, right? The sun shield that had to be stowed. And in that, we learned in a positive way that how you test and how you test like you fly, which is always a number one mantra on what you do right on the ground, we had to come up with alternate ways. So when we had a sun shield too big for the chamber, we took that, we scaled it to one third, every feature perfect to a right. one third scale, put it in a chamber, took our computer model, scale that to a one third, test correlated the model, so we did have a cornering in terms of a, a test verified, and then dimensionally controlled it as we scaled it out, right? So, so the team found solutions where we were to some degree limited by the physics, right, and, and, the, and the ability for chambers on there, and that's what I'd call a hugely positive lesson learned because I don't think our appetite's gonna get smaller from web, right? So when you look at that, we're gonna have similar limitations, and we have now evidence, and we're gonna be building more, certainly over the next you know, five and a half months, of how our ability to correlate models and subscale articles, and then scale it up and predict it. And right now, thermals, got a lot of thumbs up in there in terms of how the behavior is performing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our next question is from Daniel Raguera from R Drone UI. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, there are a lot of people wondering here what programming languages were used for the onboard software uh, how do you handle the computational uh, redundancy? Uh, thank you, thank you for your amazing work, and, and uh, I hope you hear more, more about the uh, James Webb Telescope. If he says it was all written in BASIC, I'm gonna, I'm gonna floor, I'm gonna fall on the floor. <laughs> And uh, I wasn't sure I caught the other part of your question, the redundancies. Everything was redundant. Everything, yeah, our, our, CT, our, our, uh, our computers were fully redundant. And uh, I think <laughs> I, that's about as much as I understood the question. It's okay. Th thank you. Thank you for all. And what, what uh, someone made the question, what next uh, on the James Webb Telescope? Uh, and I'm wondering if you can extend any more the Gem West Telescope's life? Well, uh, when, when it comes to the James Webb Space Telescope life, um, right now uh, when we launched by design, our limiting resource was propellant. And, and right now because of uh, the, the efficiency or, or the accuracy with which Arian put us on orbit, and our uh, accuracy and effectiveness at inst uh, implementing our mid-course corrections, we have uh, quite a bit of fuel margin right now relative to 10 years. Uh, you know, roughly speaking, it's around 20 years of, of propellant. Roughly speaking, and that's TBD. Thank you. Our next question is from Lee Roop from AL.com. Lee Roop, your line is open. Yes, hello. Uh, thanks for doing this, and thanks for taking my question. I'm uh, talking to you from Huntsville, where we uh, have been following this. People have been following this uh, really closely since the launch, and uh, I know that we, uh, some folks down here, built the, the, sun, the sun shields and some other contributions. Just like, is there anyone that could tell me, uh, you know, how... Uh, how did everything that we contributed to you guys, how did it all work out? Yeah, there was a lot of contributions from Huntsville. I remember going down after we completed the first sun shield layer. So those big silver diamond shaped, you know, patterns, five of them that, that give us a 600 degree Fahrenheit differential. Uh, right now look wonderful. We're, we're already seeing something on the order of about 500 degrees in the, in the differential between those layers. So with Nexolve down there, they did a, a wonderful job. The optics were also tested at Marshall Space Flight Center uh, six at a time, once uh, with just bare beryllium to 150 nanometers of surface figure accuracy, and then again after being 
um, you know, coated with their, their gold reflective layer for infrared down to better than 20 nanometers. And that's where laser interferometry techniques were perfected so greatly. They're used now for ophthalmology and, and LASIK. So, so in Huntsville, between Marshall and Nexolve in particular, uh, tremendous contributions. I remember being down there for that layer one. I got, I got a coin from the mayor of Huntsville um, there. I still got it on my shelf with all my other coins. So it was a, it was a proud moment for, for me and for the city. Thank you. And that is all the time we have for the first question and answer session. We will now move on to the next set of speakers and hold another Q&A session later in the program. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. I will encourage you to step off and we will get our new group up here. Thank get out, so everybody. And congratulations. <laughs> okay, I think well, we have the to next say group coming in, filing in behind me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, I think we some major on. news just broke there. We're going to we have to nerd on that for a second. A section where we start focusing on what's coming up next. Uh, for anybody for the last session who uh, didn't get a question completely answered or has some more follow-up, as always, go ahead and write someone in the NASA Office of Communications and we will get you an answer or any more details. Uh, but for now, moving on to our second group. Uh, we have today John Durning, the Web Deputy Project Manager at NASA Goddard, Lee Feinberg, the Web Optical Telescope Element Manager at NASA Goddard, Jane Rigby, yeah. Web Operations Project Scientist at NASA Goddard, and Heidi Hamill, the Vice President hey. of Science at Aura, which manages the Space Telescope mm -hmm. Science Institute. We're going to have the exact same plan as before. We'll have a couple of opening remarks from John Durning, and then we will switch right into the bulk of the time being for questions. As before, you would press star one to get yourself into the queue for questions. So with that, passing on. Well, hello, yes, my name is John Durning. Uh, let's see, the last two weeks, 14 days, have been a spectacular success and set the table for the fantastic sciences to come. So uh, on our panel, we have two scientists to talk about that. But in the next 15 days, uh, we're going to uh, get to our M uh, okay. In the next 15 days, or at 15 days from now, January 20 23rd, we will arrive at our L2 insertion location. And then we'll fire, as was talked about previously, our MCC2 burn and get into that. But in, while we're getting to that point, in the next 15 days, we will be phasing the mirror, taking those 18 mirror segments and aligning them so they uh, essentially perform as one monolith. And Lee is on the panel here to talk about those. I'm sure there's questions about that. He's here to help you understand how that works. So uh, without further ado, uh, that's what's happening in the future. I should say also that uh, we'll start turning on the instruments uh, in the next week or so. And then after we get into L2, as the instruments get cold enough, they're going to be start turning on all the various instruments so that we can cool down, do their own um, calibration activities to, to end the commissioning when they're all calibrated and ready for that first light. So with that, I'll turn over to the questions. And once again, to ask a question, please press star one. And our next question is from Elizabeth Howell from space.com. Hello, congratulations again. This is probably for John. You just gave us a good roadmap of what to expect. Can you also give us a sense about which ones of these milestones, um, if any, would be the most technically complex or the ones that could be potential um, difficulties, the ones that you're trying to manage the most, I suppose? Uh, let's see. So what the most difficult milestones ahead? Well, let's see, each instrument has their own set of milestones that will be challenging to them once they reach temperature, making sure they get it all aligned. Um, but there's nothing uh, project or, or uh, mission-wide that is a major milestone once we get an L2 and we start cooling down. The mirror themselves, I'll let Lee touch base on what are significant milestones over the next 10, 12 days as they align the telescope. So with that, Lee, you want to talk about? Yeah, um, so let's see, starting on Tuesday, we'll, we'll start deploying the mirrors. So they're in a launch configuration. And there's about a 10 to 12 day process to get all of the mirrors 
forward by uh, roughly half an inch, and that puts them in a position where we can do the detailed optical alignment. So this is sort of the first step. We call it mirror deployment. Um, but then after that, there's actually a three-month process um, to align the mirrors, starting with the very first light on all 18 segments. And at roughly four months into the mission, right around day 120, is when we think the entire telescope will be aligned. But that's happening in parallel to the commissioning of instruments. So we'll be working closely with our instrument team partners, and they'll be turning on different instruments and turning on the cooler. And we'll then use those instruments to align the telescope and to further uh, refine the telescope. Thank you. Our next question is from Marina Corin from the Atlantic. Hey everyone, uh, congratulations. Uh, first one for Lee. Uh, why did designers go with hexagon shaped mirrors for this telescope and how are you feeling about making those final segment adjustments in the coming days? Uh, and then a question for John. Um, how many people in the mock have uh, tested positive for COVID in the last two weeks and how are you handling shifts and work moving forward as people have to go into isolation? Thank you. Well, I guess I'll, I'll take this softball. Um, so hexagons. Actually, there were a couple of different configurations very early on. It wasn't only hexagons. Um, but hexagons are a really nice shape for making a, a mirror that you want to make in pieces. Um, you know, if you think about the different geometries that you could use, like triangles and squares, um, those have very sharp corners, which we generally don't like when we make mirrors. We like mirrors that are symmetric. Um, if you remember, there's an actuator at the center of the mirror that moves forward and back, and the hexagon shape works well with uh, being able to change the curvature of the mirror. And we were able to put three mirrors on each wing, which really was nice to be able to fold it up. So, so that all worked pretty easily. Uh, so. Okay, so the, for the COVID question, turns out we've ha overcome many challenges on this uh, project from hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, you name it. So this was just another challenge that we faced, and we basically are following the CDC guidelines as far as uh, distancing, wearing masks all the time, as you could see, as well as close contact, proximity. We have had positive tests here at the Institute, but fortunately we have testing people before they come on, have to be tested before they get into the facility or show when they, you know, if they left their hotel that they tested, and they test positive, they identify they call the uh, organization here at the Institute, the HR group, and they say they've been positive and we have these trackers on us that, you know, proximity trackers that they can then take that piece of information and say who was in close contact to the people who had tested positive. And then we take the protocol that we need to do, which is isolate them and um, make sure that, uh, you know, we don't have, um, they have to go and re uh, stay in isolation, take tests to make sure they're, they're negative. So we've had that exercise a couple of times in the past two weeks. And we've actually worked out very well. There were very intense top periods to do what we did the past two weeks of deployments. And we were able to accomplish that even with these positive tests because we've, we've been proactive as well as we have workstations and our laptops that we can work remotely and still do the job we need to do. Those, they're not as fancy as the workstations you see behind us. But they're sufficient, we can get the telemetry, all the engineers can work at their hotels or if they're nearby at their homes, get their job done and be successful. And then we have taken this, the measure starting today, given you know the um, surge of COVID that's in the area that we have decided to proactively reduce the in-present staffing in this room, we distribute it across the, the, the part of the building and remotely to home so that we even get greater distance than the CDC guidelines for the next couple of weeks as we work through the recent surge of the COVID around us. But we've been very successful accomplishing our task. And fortunately, while there have been people with symptoms for COVID, most everybody has recovered from that, that exposure and they seem to, if they're not back at work, they're trending in the right direction to come back to work. So it was, it's actually a challenge we, we overcome just like all the others we've faced. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Jeff Faust from Space News. Uh, good afternoon. A question for Lee. I wonder if you can go in a little bit more detail the, the optical alignment process. What steps are, are involved in getting all the mirrors aligned? And what sort of update can we expect along the way before you reach the final alignment in, uh, in a few months' time? Thank you. 
Yeah, I'll go through the alignment and, and uh, then I'll pass it to Jane to go g give you how we'll be updating. Um, but basically, you know, the, the first thing, it's, it's kind of a unique thing here because we have this 18 segments and we expect them to be very misaligned. You know, we just, we just literally deployed a wing, so this is not a perfect monolithic mirror at this point. Um, so when we, when we take what we call the first light of the telescope, we're actually expecting to see 18 separate spots that are probably going to be pretty blurry because everything's going to be misaligned. But it's essentially like we're going to have 18 separate telescopes. And the first thing we're going to have to do is sort of align those individual telescopes, the, the, those individual primary mirror segments. And then we're going to take all those 18 spots and put them on top of each other. We call that stacking. Um, but at that point, we still don't have a nice tight, you know, a star doesn't quite look like a star. It's still going to be very blurry. And we have to go through the process of aligning the mirrors to the point at which they're actually aligned to a fraction of a wavelength of light. And um, we, we use a series of algorithms that we developed actually very early in the program to demonstrate this program is feasible. We demonstrated them on a, a, a scaled test bed. Um, so, and, we've, and we have models that simulate all this, but this will be the first time that we do it on the flight telescope with real stars. So we're, we're real excited. It's a little bit of a long process, um, but at the end of it, we expect to see an image of a star that looks like a star. And then we expect to get that over the full field, which means all four instruments will have beautiful images. And I'm going to pass it to Jane to talk a little bit about how we'll be communicating some of this information to you. And I should just add that, that um, to, to add a little bit to what Lee said, you know, just the, the change of alignment. We start with the mirrors off by millimeters, and we're driving them to be aligned to within less than the size of a coronavirus, right, like to tens of nanometers. It's just, it's this very deliberate process that is time consuming. So. Yeah, like just so everybody knows, the first images that we take are not, this telescope is not ready out of the box. The first images are going to be ugly. It's going to be blurry, and as Lee said, 18 of these little, little um, images all over the sky. So we have to drive that into one telescope. I like to think of it as, it's like we have 18 mirrors that are right now little prima donnas all doing their own thing, singing their own tune in whatever key they're in, and we have to make them work like a chorus. And that is, a, that is a methodical, laborious process. We want to make sure that the first images that the world sees, that, the, that, that humanity sees from this telescope, are do justice to this $10 billion uh, uh, telescope and are not those, you know, hey, look, a star. So we are planning a series of wow images to be released at the end of commissioning when we start normal science operations that are designed to showcase what this telescope can do and that showcase all four science instruments and to really knock everybody's socks off. Thank you. Our next question is from Alexandra with Nature Magazine. Hi, thanks. I have a follow-up on that, I think for Jane as well. Um, I'm really curious about like where the photons are coming from during this whole commissioning process. What are sort of the astronomical targets you'll be pointing at during alignment and commissioning, and, and, and where are those photons coming from that will be bouncing around in the scope for the next couple of months? So the, the first images, are, the first targets are some stars that are the brightness that Lee and team need. So they're not, um, you know, they're fainter than your eye can see, but not by a whole lot. They're reasonably bright stars. So for the first part of telescope alignment, that's it. We look at some stars. That's kind of boring. Then as we get into, but important, as we get into science instrument commissioning, which is the last six weeks of, of this six-month process, then we start looking at a larger variety of targets. That's where we're checking that all four science instruments are working correctly. Those targets are chosen not because they're scientifically amazing, but because they're useful, things like wavelength calibration, um, things like check. we have some sources that are nice and uniform brightness so we can check how the detectors are working. So there's a bunch of calibration and, and checkout that's happening. A lot of those targets are in the Large Magellanic Cloud because um, we can always see the north and south ecliptic poles. Um, they're always available. So looking out of the plane of the solar system up and out of the plane of the solar system down, that's always available. So a lot of our targets for commissioning are there because then we, could, we, knew, we didn't have to keep replanning if the launch date changed.
Thank you. Our next question is from Jim Siegel, NASA Tech. Uh, thank you. Obviously, uh, the number of scientific engineering and even educational achievements uh, will be uh, very significant from uh, James Webb. Uh, however, um, I'd like to ask you if you could, if, if uh, like the ordinary people, <laughs> uh, so to speak, uh, on Earth, the rest of us Earthlings, uh, what can I tell my readers of, of those people about what uh, this James Webb uh, telescope means to them? Thank you. Hi, this is Heidi Hamill. You know, what you can tell ordinary people about this telescope is that it's an example of what NASA and its collaborators can do when they work together, when NASA and ESA and the Canadian Space Agency work together, they can achieve remarkable things. You've, you've heard people talking about how, oh, it looks so easy. It is not easy. NASA makes it look easy, and sometimes they're a victim of their own success because it looks easy, but it's not easy. It's very challenging. And I think that we all, as a humanity, can be proud that we are working collectively to do great things, to, to expand our knowledge of the universe, to make the universe more accessible to all of us, all of the pictures and all of the data and the knowledge from this telescope will be shared with all of the taxpayers who paid for it. So this becomes a part of our legacy to the future, this ex exploration that we as a team have been doing. So I, I think that, that that's something you can share with the ordinary person. Thank you. Our next question is from Irene Klotz, Aviation Week. Thank you. Um, actually, for can I just add James, a little bit to that? Selected, can you hear me? Um, have you actually selected a target boring or otherwise that's going to be used for the mirror alignment and the image stacking? And if so, could you please provide the name or the designation of that target? Thanks. There's a list of stars that are bright enough, and we'll pick and – We'll look up which ones are observable now, and we'll pick one of them. Um, but just to go back to a minute to the previous question, I just wanted to add a little bit and say that I think if you look at a really big picture of what is the science that we're doing with this telescope, it's understanding what is our place, where do we all come from, and like how do we fit in to the universe? Um, how did we get here? How weird are planets like the Earth? How did our galaxy and our solar system come to be? And so, you know, for a normal, for an average person, that's also a very personal question. How did I get here? What is my history? Not just of my own life or my own ancestors, but how did we all get here? How did it all happen? That's the big, big, big picture that we're working on. Our next question comes from Reese Nations, the Well News, Washington, D.C. Hi, thank you. So a uh, large part of my question were pretty much already touched on, but I was <clears throat> wondering, you know, given the uh, the launch accuracy and the accuracy of the mid-course corrections on the way to L2, um, are there any, is there any possibility that we might be able to see the first clear images from uh, the James Webb a little bit early uh, ahead of schedule uh, sometime in June? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so one of the things that we're paying very close attention to is how the telescope and the instruments are cooling, because actually what prevents us from getting images even sooner is how long they take to cool. Um, it turns out actually early in the mission, we did find things were cooling a little bit faster than our models had predicted. And so um, it does look like there's a potential maybe of a day or two faster, um, but not, a significant, not significantly faster. Uh, so basically our original timeline is close. We might be a couple days before that. Thank you. Our next question is from Felipe Orgoski from Polish Public TV. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Filip Ogorzelski from the Science Channel of the Polish Public Television. 
First of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to see the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope live in front of Guyana. Now we are preparing a documentary movie about the JBS mission called A New Window to the Universe. So, uh, now we know that the most of the dangerous and difficult steps are behind of us. And I am very happy about it. So, do we have any future steps, uh, steps of deployment and calibra calibration to be concerned about, or can we be 100% sure that the JBST deployment is a complete success? And maybe what are you the most proud of when it goes to the whole mission? Excuse me, can you repeat the 100% sure of what? I didn't catch that. Uh, can we be 100% sure that the JVST deployment is a complete success? Oh, yes. We can confirm that the deployments that just have taken place has been 100% successful. We have the telemetry and the performance that matches our predictions. So we know for sure that the telescope is deployed the way we wanted it to be deployed. Oh, what were we most proud of? Oh. oh, my gosh. We were most proud of the collaborative effort to reach this moment. I mean, for me, it's been 15 years. For Lee, it's been longer. And for Jane and for Heidi, it's been equally. The t many years put in of sweat and labor to get to this point. We're most proud of looking at that screen that shows an image of what's on an orbit, but knowing, based on telemetry, that that's what it looks like. It is a fully deployed telescope ready to form fantastic science to expand our knowledge. So that's what we're all, that's, me personally, that's what I'm all prou very proud of. Do you, guys have one, do you want to add anything? Well, I just want to say one thing is, um, you know, from an optical perspective, we still have a long way to go. So this was an incredible achievement. Um, one of the most amazing, uh, you know, achievements in space that I've personally ever witnessed. But we're not there yet. We still have to deploy all the mirrors. We have to align all the mirrors. We have to get all the instruments working. And so um, I will tell you, the engineering team is not resting. We're, we're still, you know, we still have that drive, and we have a few long months in front of us. Um, I think when we have, you know, images that look like, you know, fine images, that's when we're really going to be 100% confident in everything. So that, that's kind of, uh, I just wanted to share that. And I'm going to add that um, I'm, I'm just a scientist. I wasn't involved in building this telescope, although I've been involved in the advisory process for over 20 years. But what I'm really proud of is the fact that this uh, engineering team that we are celebrating today uh, has done such a fantastic job of getting us from just concepts 30 years ago and then just drawings and then pieces to a fully deployed telescope that Lee and, and his team is now going to focus, and eventually uh, the scientists will get to use. I think we're all proud to be a part of that team and proud of the achievements of the engineers today to get us to this point. We're at about 3.30, but we have quite a few questions left, so we are going to extend and keep uh, answering questions. Um, so. Have at it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question is from Marsha Dunn from Associated Press. Uh, just to chirp in here. Um, Marsha, I guess we're going to not able to hear you. I'm torn right now between cutting back to our conversation, but also waiting to hear like what other big bomb gets dropped in, uh, casually as part of an answer to a question. <laughs> I think we'll move on to the next question. But I am gathering up your questions, and we'll uh, jump up back to those as soon as we can. Now. Thank you, and congrats again. A uh, couple of qu uh, quick questions, hopefully. Um, first of all, can someone just confirm on the record that you know, NASA is not is not planning to release any of the early images, those blurry, fuzzy images of, of, uh, of Starlight? I just want to confirm uh, whether those will be released publicly as they are gathered, or will we not see any, any images until that big public release uh, in the summertime? And also, um, is there a chance um, that the L2 insertion boom, uh, I think on the 23rd of January, uh, based on the, what you're seeing with the trajectory, is there a chance that that could be 
deleted or deferred, uh, you know, and that would afford you some further fuel savings. Just wondering about that. Thanks. To your first question, the plan is still to issue the releases at one time, not on the way. But the, the other answer is the burn um, is targeted for the 23rd. It's, it is, uh, has to happen, uh, but it is a low-risk burn, and we have tolerance. If we miss it by a day or so, for whatever reason, we're fine. But yes, so the, the burn is... Uh, Target for the 23rd, but there is some flexibility around it. Okay. So I think one of the, the watchwords for all of commissioning is flexibility. Things are not going to go exactly the way we expected. Um, and that's, that's okay. Um, we have a timeline for commissioning that is a, this Excel spreadsheet that has down to the minute how we're all going to be spending the next six months of our lives. And we all know that that is not actually the timeline we're going to execute, but that's the plan, and we're going to ha we will move it around as we need be. The current plan um, is yes that we're going to hold the images to release at six months when all four instruments are 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 ready for science. Um, but I we have to be flexible during this process, and um, so I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Our next question comes from Manuel Mazzanti from Debate. Hello, everybody. Congratulations uh, on this incredible day. I'm still curious about the speed of the telescope. Uh, we know that it's slowing down day by day. Uh, we went from several kilometers per hour to 0.4 kilometers uh, per hour right now uh, per second. Uh, and, and I was wondering, what is the speed that you are planning the telescope to have when it reaches the L2 point? And if it has to be a precise speed in order to exactly do the L2 board. Thank you. So, I mean, I don't know this precise speed, but it is driven by physics. So we're, we have our trajectory, and it's going to slow down uh, by just the orbit dynamic phenomena at the trajectory we're at. And uh, it's, we already can calculate what that is. I don't know firsthand, but we have our burn maneuver uh, factoring in the speed we're going to get when we get there. So um, it's really uh, pretty much basic physics at this point, how it will slow down and get to its uh, L2 junction. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question is from Leo Enright from Irish Television. Uh, thanks again. Uh, today would have been Stephen Hawking's 80th birthday. Uh, now, Stephen absolutely loved coincidences, so I'm, I'm quite certain he would have been chuffed uh, by this coincidence. Um, the question is, is almost impossible, I think, which is why it must be for Heidi. Um, it, can you talk, is there anything you can say about what JWST will be doing that, that might give us further information about the stuff that Stephen Hawking cared about so much, you know, thermodynamics of black holes, Hawking radiation, Penrose stuff, you know, all of that good stuff. Okay. I'm going to take that one because I love black holes. Um, right, so the web science program for the first year, we are going to be doing more than 300 different science programs that were submitted by researchers from all over the globe. It was a cutthroat competition. We rejected three quarters of all the accepted proposals. And we're taking the top ranked quarter. Those include quite a few proposals to study black holes. Most of those are to study black holes that are in the centers of galaxies. It turns out that every galaxy has a black hole lurking in its center. Big galaxies have big black holes. Little galaxies have little black holes. We don't know why. Um, but when I tell this to school kids, they're like, that's fair, it's sharing. Um, but we don't actually understand how that, how that evolves to be. Um, one of the projects I'm really interested in is a project to look at the first, uh, the most distant quasars that have ever been found. These are billion with a B solar mass black holes that we see as they looked only a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang, so very far away. That light's been traveling through time for almost, traveling for almost the whole history of the universe. 
And nobody really knows how do you make a quasar? How do you put a billion you know, suns worth of stuff in a black hole and get all that done in only a couple hundred million years? Nobody really knows, but we found them, and that's gonna be one target to go study those. And then there are other programs to see how those black holes and their galaxies have co-evolved through the, the history of the universe. And I'm just gonna jump in here to uh, make a pitch to remind people that the core science of this telescope was to see the very first light in the universe, the first galaxies that formed with some clever projects, perhaps even the first stars that formed. And, and that's its raison d'etre. That's why it was built the way it was built. But this is a great observatory that not only can do that science, but also the black hole science that Jane was talking about. Also, the cosmic evolution of galaxies over time. Also, probing the atmospheres of planets around other stars, looking for the first stars that are forming inside dusty nebulae in our own Milky Way galaxy, and even exploring many things in our solar system, which is my field of science, which is why Jane took that question. Um, but we will have a really robust program of solar system observations to complement the in situ spacecraft work that we're doing with the NASA Planetary Science Division. And this is the power of Webb, just like it has been the power of Hubble. With a great observatory, you can do amazing science over a vast range of astrophysical topics. And that is why we as a community have been so excited about this day, getting to the point where this telescope is, is uh, on its way uh, to get our science done um, starting about six months from now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Don Ladia from CD. BBC. Okay, and I think with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, return to our conversation. Uh, just because uh, I thought it'd be great to let Heidi uh, let me let me return to our let me turn to our conversation. Uh, it's been a uh, uh, a hell of a day, <laughs> I gotta say. Um, what I wanted to uh, do is just talk a little bit about, or just kind of run through a few more of these questions, because so many of you have asked many of them. Uh, but what I have to do first is I got to actually switch, I got to get some voices out of my head. Um, it's weird, usually the voices in my head are British. Instead, the voices that I'm hearing right now are actually coming from some dudes on NASA TV. So, we'll go ahead and uh, get these tuned out here. And if you'll pardon me as I do that, like I said, this is just what happens when you're live and things are just sort of happening on their own. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off that press conference. It's been uh, really great to hear so far. I'm going to mute you. Stop it. And we'll talk to you later about your alter egos talking to you. Yeah, I, I do get these. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I, 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 uh, I haven't had a voice in my head uh, since uh, just a couple minutes ago when I had a press conference going on. So, hey, we're back. We're talking about uh, Webb having our own little conversation. Um, again, uh, just a few questions that have come in that I'll get to really quick. Let's talk about what will happen uh, to Webb after it finishes its mission. Will it be orbiting L2 forever? Not really, right? I'm seeing kind of, no, it'll fall out of that orbit, won't it? And uh, so the end of mission is a little depressing, a little sad. So hmm. um, so from what I heard from Jim Green a while ago is that the plan, you know, if it's the, the reason of the end of mission is out of fuel, then it would just let it drift. But we'll also have it collect data as it drifts as long as it goes. So um, and then it will start orbiting around the sun on its own. And then we can probably still track it, but uh, it won't be staying in L2. So it won't be dragged along by the Earth, or it won't always stay close to us. It will, you know, on its own orbit and go farther and farther away from, our, from us. So maybe from time to time, we'll pass by GWST again once we go around the Earth a little faster than GWST. So, um, but that's only, uh, well, the collect data collection part only comes in if, um, if, if the failure 
uh, or the end of mission is caused by uh, out of fuel or out of propellant. So if um, the mission ends for other reasons, like for example, the cryo cooler stopped working, then there will be no more data uh, on its way out. But um, that also opens up a whole new possibility is anyone can go out there and capture GWST if you so may wish, because there are still parts of it working perhaps and also valuable material on it. So uh, if anyone private sector has the ability to uh, send a spacecraft out there to L2 or to track down GWST or tow it back to us, you know. A, sal a salvage operation, huh? <laughs> uh, well, uh, actually, during that press conference, I think we heard some uh, really great uh, breaking news, as they say in the news business. Um, we're looking like we may have as much as 20 years or around 20 years worth of fuel on board. Uh, that was really cool. I mean, the, the minimum mission for Webb is five, is five years. That's That's the... That's the factory warranty. And now the nominal mission was 10 years. And when I heard, oh, there's a lot more fuel left on board initially, I thought, oh, okay, maybe we're talking like 13, 15 years. 20 years, possibly. And, and, and so, ha, ha, that, go ahead. That's a long time. That's, that's a lot of mission. <laughs> that is double, a lot. Double your money, double your fun. Well, um, I, I would say so. I mean, you, you, you're getting, and also there's going to be a question of just how well do you manage that fuel over the course of the mission, right? You know, uh, what, you know, can, will they be able to find ways of saving gas along the way? Well, I'm sure they're working on it. You know, there's all, you know, different ways of trying to optimize your um, fuel consumption. And, and I would imagine there's a team that is hard at work on that problem and has probably been for years. So it's it, that was a great little kind of like, oh, and by the way, comment <laughs> in the press conference. I know, noticed we all took note of it. Um, a 20 year fuel lifetime is a fantastic thing to hear confirmed by leaders of the mission like that. That implies they have pretty high confidence and um, none of us had known what significantly longer than 10 years meant until today. So what a great uh, little nugget of I know. positive information that is. Uh, we think we may have doubled it, you know, maybe, we'll see. We've doubled it-ish, 20 years-ish, you know. Like... 20 years is a really long time for a space telescope that's, mission. Hubble's that's amazing. going into 32 years now, but that's really unprecedented. Most missions are, you know, 10, 15 years. It, it really, yeah. Outside. I mean, when I, uh, <clears throat> you know, when I worked on, on HST back in the 1990s, uh, it was just before, I came on board just before the very first servicing mission, and I remember when I was hired, you know, they said, yeah, you know, we're, we're expecting this to be mm, probably 10 years, 15. And, and if we're really lucky, we'll get 20. That was, that was how, that was my onboarding to the, uh, Hubble Space Telescope mission. So yeah. Um, and, and now of course, 32 years, it really does. Uh, it's, it's, it's really beaten the records and who knows Webb obviously has a much stronger fuel constraint or well, Hubble doesn't have any fuel constraint but and also Hubble the Hubble team has been very active over the last 10 years um working on these lifetime extension initiatives so mm -hmm. um that has been a huge reason why we've got so much extra Hubble time is that the teams have really been very you know purposeful about the use of all the systems on board and that goes into you know that knowledge that they learned will be able to inform the web team as well when they think about how do we extend the lifetime of this space telescope. And it's just so exciting because, you know, the field is going to change in 20 years. And when, when people were planning for just a five-year mission, right, at, at, that was the minimum mission, then you really had to write proposals in cycle one that you knew what you were going to do in the second year and the third yeah. year because you may not have that many years. And now we're talking about something that, you know, can kind of like release that particular pressure and give us so much more science in that longitudinal way on the timeline. Really exciting news. Uh, this one just came in as we were talking about extending lifetime. Of course, uh, you know, uh, Bearwald uh, there asked if reaction wheels become a problem for Kepler or became a problem for Kepler and Hubble. Oh yeah, uh, he, it basically ended Kepler's mission. And uh, how big is the risk of failure for, for Webb? Or have there been improvements? Uh, Bert, uh, I know you're more of an optical guy, but uh, what do you hear about them, their uh, reaction wheels and gyroscopes on web? Well, the reaction wheels and gyroscopes that have were replaced on Hubble at the last servicing mission in 2009, am mm -hmm. I correct, uh, are still keeping it going. 
Um, some have failed since then. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can only say that they should at least be that good, uh, but I don't know anything more about, about uh, any improvements. But uh, I, I'm quite sure that they've um, spec them out with uh, you know certain redundancy to be able to keep it going as you know you know for the anticipated uh, you know ten plus year mission. By the way, twenty years is not a surprise to anyone. It's simply they never talked about it, right? Uh, right. In chat, you know, it never hurts to under promise and over deliver. Uh, Any time that you're able to um, uh, uh, a lot for things going really well then that's just the bonus right you say it's in this range but it could only be this you know five years minimum we hope for 10 but you know and you know you've, you've done all the calculations and systematics that it is possible you get 20 years if everything goes as well as it has you just don't advertise it right so you you kind of hide that one you kind of hide you know it's like you, you play those cards a little closer to the vest, especially when there's a lot of public expectation. I, I, I guess, and I don't, I, I, I know it's unprofessional to speculate, but I'm not a professional, so screw that. Uh, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, if they're talking about 20 years now, you, you know what I mean? Like, what else is left behind the vest? And obviously, they don't have a crystal ball any more than any anybody else here does. But I think they're, well, I think, I think, you know. Who knows? We maybe it'll go beyond twenty. <laughs> it's just it's tremendously exciting. Uh, I understand mm -hmm. that uh, they did, you know, again the nominal ten-year mission. So what do you do? You fuel it up with twenty years worth of fuel. Like you launch knowing that you've got notionally somewhere on the order of twenty years of fuel left. And I heard about that, but it's one of those things. Hearing somebody finally say that was just uh, tremendously exciting. Uh, <laughs> make it forty. Yeah. Well, you know, hey, why not? And if they do come up with a way of uh, <clears throat> flying out there and gassing it up uh, in 20 plus some odd years from now, and it's deemed worthwhile, then sure, why not? All right, now let's uh, let's switch over to uh, a couple more questions here, and uh, you know, I think what we're going to do is we're going to wrap this up at. at uh, in about the next uh, 12 minutes, folks, because uh, we've gone longer than expected. I know my guests have been extremely patient here, so I'm going to do the best I can to get through a few more of these questions with you. Uh, let's see. And, and uh, well, you know, uh, how can average citizen help ensure your success? I, I assume web success going forward. Uh, so, uh, Patty and Aaron, as, as people who uh, work at uh, Goddard and are uh, and you t and you too, uh, you know, uh, Bert, who are dependent on the uh, public paycheck. Uh, how do we how do we support you guys? I think first and foremost, stay excited. So um, there will be a lot of exciting images and science come out, and you will see them happen. So um, do get excited about them. Read these articles and maybe um, join us in the journey of understanding the universe's origin. Because um, just staying informed and get staying excited would already be a, mm -hmm. a, a huge encouragement for us for doing the science. But also, um, not that I've heard of, but hard to imagine there will be none, is that uh, uh, citizen science projects. So, um, you know, JWST is expected to image the sky at uh, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented depth. So we're talking about even for a small patch of the sky, there will be, you know, a couple tens of thousands of galaxies in there. And of course, we now have smart algorithm to help us identify these objects. But I don't see why not if we can put out these objects and help have people look at them and help us identify the morphology of galaxies. You know, what do they look like? Is this blob um, a galaxy? Is this a disky galaxy? Is this a um, just a cloud of gas? We don't know. But um, there are certain things from past successful uh, Hubble citizen science project that can be replicated here. Great. And, uh, and thank you, Aaron. That's great response. And yeah, definitely get involved. Uh, and also a super chat that came in a, while, a little while back from uh, Convergence Mechanical. Is there any interesting stuff in the far IR or sub millimeter range? And why isn't Webb built uh, sensitive to this range like ESA's Herschel? So ESA did have a, uh, a far infrared 
uh, space telescope called the Herschel Observatory. And uh, yeah, it did go very far into the infrared as opposed to Webb, which is sensitive to mostly the mid-infrared. So why are we doing mid-infrared with Webb and not going into the really long wavelength stuff? Well, I think the same can also go and ask, why doesn't Webb do optical imaging? Why doesn't Webb do UV? We have mm. so many things we want to see. But for, I, I think the biggest thing is the techn technological tra challenges because um, observing at different wavelengths really require instruments to build in specific way. For example, Webb's uh, mirror using gold uh, coating on the, in, in, in the surface is really optimizing for reflections of infrared light. Yes. And so imagine uh, putting an instrument that does far infrared will require some more drastic change to the overall design of web and it will be hard so right now we only left with i think um well Herschel is one of them but also sophia which is the uh telescope airborne telescope that's carried by um, a modified boeing 747 so it's still operating but after that i think um uh, we just have to wait. So one of the telescope or, or smaller size uh, probe size uh, mission that was uh, uh, recommended by the 2021 Decatur survey is the um, is, is going to be in far infrared. So hopefully in the future we have its own dedicated instrument that um, will tap into this wavelength. Uh, so. Uh, so thanks, Aaron, and I'm sorry I didn't mean to put you on the spot here, so to speak, uh, with my uh, single shot of you, but uh, I'll come back to the four of us. Here we are. Uh, so what uh, what determined uh, the L2 location over, uh, say, L1? Uh, so we have, these, uh, we have these five Lagrangian points. What's so great about L2 versus L1? Don't we have spacecraft at L1? And if so, what are they doing mm -hmm. out there? Earth's on L1. Um, so there is the Discover spacecraft that is looking at the full Earth from that position. So L1 is the position between the Sun and the Earth, right? Yeah, I'll see if I can bring up a, a, an there. illustration of it. Yeah, uh, but keep going. It's a back. great place to do Earth observing. So it, I, I think the best picture to answer this question would be the one where you were showing the telemetry, you know, the feeding into the simulation and showing us where the spacecraft and the Sun Shield are right now, because on that okay. visualization, had a vector towards the sun and a vector towards the earth. And you could see that the sun shield was blocking both. And so that's exactly, you know, that is the main driver for why L2. If you, if you go back up to where this, you know, the telemetry from the spacecraft was showing us we had a fully deployed mirror. Yeah, I'm bringing that, the mirror I'll bring that page up. Sun shield, yep. Yep, there Pretty it close. is. Yeah, it's so a... Yeah, so the way the way the graphic is oriented, you don't actually see that the shield is 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 directly aiming back to the sun, but basically Webb is like flying like this, right? So that sun shield is blocking the infrared um, signal from both the sun and the Earth, uh, where we are at L two. Okay, great, uh, and then uh, and then so the L one location would kind of be the almost like the opposite place that's where you want to go if you if your mission is to observe the sun if you want to look at the sun or if you want to look turn around and look at the full illuminated disk of earth l1 is the place to be if you want to look away from the sun i.e do astrophysics then l2 is the place to be great and uh you know l4 and l5 are nice they're stable but there's a lot of junk flying around in there and that's bad yeah we don't want that Great. Plus, if you you would you wouldn't be able to design a sun shield that could cover both the signal from the Earth and oh, the sun. Right now, you have to block two sources. The yeah, problem is also pretty important. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say you're blocking you're blocking light from two directions, which means now your field of view is even more constrained. Okay, fair fair enough. Uh, let me bring up another question here. Uh, and oh well, thank you very much, Morten. I uh, just want to send a massive respect to the brilliant scientists working on in JWST. I'm a, Thank you. Yeah, we are in awe as well. Uh, and uh, but thank you so much for the super chat. Really do appreciate it. All right, let's uh, hop over to another one here. Um, so, okay, this is a great question. Uh, a, a five pound note from uh, from B Chris. How does the cryo cooler on the telescope work? Ooh, that's a really interesting subject, and we probably don't have time to go into all the gory details of it, but. Uh, We've flown in very cold telescopes before, and uh, I know it's spacecraft like Spitzer and Herschel were cooled by letting uh, helium boil off and carry the heat away. 
Is that the case with Web, though? Is that how we're doing this with Web? Anybody know? No? Okay. Uh, the short answer. Yes and no. Yes and no? Okay. So, what do you know of yes it, Bert? No. So, um, if you look on the back of uh, Web and the one page, the web page that you have set up there, if you go to the deployment step yep. of of the radiator it shows it like from behind there you go there we are that that what you might think is a really innocuous looking uh little structure there is actually incredibly important uh that is a radiator and what is a radiator something that radiates heat so you'd say well that's interesting why is it black well black as you know if it's hit by light absorbs all that heat right but if it's not being hit by light, if it's, say, looking at the coldness of space and it itself is warm, then it, in fact, radiates heat as well as you would think black absorbs heat. Interesting, huh? In other words, it has oh. high emissivity. Well, that little deployment of the little extra rectangle or triangle at the bottom there gives it enough surface area that it passively cools much of the instrument module. So much of what is required to get the uh, instruments cold is accomplished by that passive radiator. Uh, there's heat pipes that basically are attached between it and the and the instruments. But uh, one of the instruments is the uh, mid infrared instrument, MIRI, right? And it's seeing a little farther out into the infrared than, say, near cam, the near infrared camera or near spec. And so it needs a cryo cooler. And a cryo cooler is basically a heat pump. Um, and that, so that heat pump is a um, three stage pulse tube cooler. You know, um, you know it's, it's very cool, um, <laughs> literally. Uh, it's very low vibration. It has a long lifespan. It's very high reliability, right? And I believe there are two of them. I, I might be wrong about that. Um, for yeah, there are two. Sure. But yes, okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it so rather than say having like a big tank on there full of uh, liquid helium uh, or or anything just to cool things, um, that cryo pump can just continually pump and cycle and, and pull heat out. Now, what is it doing? It's, it's getting those detectors on MIRI as well as the instrument itself down to like uh, four degrees Kelvin uh, for much of the instrument and the sensor is millikelvin. Wow. Um, so it's, it's, it's amazing and it does so with an incredible stability uh, for calibration, uh, which goes back to answering the question, uh, why doesn't James Webb see out into the uh, farther far infrared uh, you'd have to cool the entire telescope down to around, you know, 10, 5, 4 oh. Kelvin, uh, which is, as uh, Aaron alluded to, the far infrared mission uh, in that case uh, would do. But, I mean, if the science demanded it, you know, again, you build different telescopes to answer different scientific questions. And if the scientific questions that Webb was designed to, you know, if Webb were designed to answer those questions, well, then, yeah, you know, you'd, you'd take Herschel, basically, and you'd, you'd supersize it and you you go you go there but then of course you're also going to be limited by you probably will have to result to like boiling off uh helium and things like that so now you're going to be limited by your uh by your coolant um let's see uh just a couple just i'm going to do a couple more questions here just because and, and there was another super chat that came in that i want to acknowledge and 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 thank and that was uh where is it i just had it um uh, it was basically it was from high tower mountain or high high mountain uh let me find you here let's see hi mountain there it is super chat from high 20 dollar super chat wow thank you so much are the shields back of the telescope will they be pointing at the sun the whole time or are they too small to be affected by the solar wind ah okay uh yes and no right they will the shields so will that's yeah. a very good question. So one of the things I heard that is stopping them from coming out and just say, we're going to have 20 years. Actually, that has not been confirmed yet because you can imagine solar pressure applied to the sun shield would actually build up momentum. 
So part of the fuel needed is to dump the momentum so the telescope won't be keep pushing outwards and leave L2. So th that part is still to be understood. So um, they will have this fully deployed telescope sit at L2 and see how much momentum does it build up over time and then do the calculation and be sure uh, how, how long of a lifetime can the onboard fuel sustain. So um, that's one of the reasons why, uh, even though we heard it 20 years, it's actually not yet confirmed. Right. And that's what they were waiting for. It won't be confirmed until 20 years goes by, you know, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but you can see here in this illustration, I mean, you've got, uh, you've got the sunlight coming in and you notice that that shield is, is bent, right? It's a bent diamond and that's quite on purpose so that there's a range of orientations that web could be put into. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, uh, pardon me as I try to get some of this audio out of coming through. Uh, but basically let me, uh, come down to here. Uh, what's going to happen is that, yeah, the sunlight pressure is going to be striking the shield and uh, it is, in fact, going to be uh, affected by it. And that's going to change the orientation of the spacecraft, which means that you have to spin up reaction wheels to counter some of that solar pressure. And when the reaction wheels keep, sp basically the reaction wheels have to keep spinning and spinning and spinning and they have to spin faster and faster and faster because the solar pressure is unrelenting. Eventually, the so the the reaction wheels reach the, what are called their saturation limit. They can't spin any faster. So you burn a little gas and you point, you point web back and you get it just back to where you want it and you continue. And then the solar pressure kicks on and on and on and on and on. And you know, you just do this as you need to. Part of what they're doing though, to combat this is to carefully schedule web so that a target that it has to point to it's kind of going to, it's kind of going to be pushed over to that next target a little bit. You know what I mean? Like you're kind of trying to, you try to ride that pressure a little bit to, you know, extend your, not have to use fuel. It's one of the many, many tricks that they're going to be doing as they operate, uh, as they operate web over the next 20 plus some odd years. Okay. Well, um, final closing thoughts, everybody. I, I, I think we've just had an amazing time together and uh, <laughs> this has just been so cool, but let me go ahead, bring us back over to here. Uh, any, uh, any final thoughts uh, before we wrap it up today? Uh, let's see, Aaron, how about you, sir? Go, for you, go with you first. It's been very uh, exciting. I'm happy to share this moment of, you know, JWST fully deployed with all of you. And of course, this is just the beginning of, you know, a decade and more of exciting science ahead of us. So um, great, this will keep me employed for at least the next few years, but also will, um, you know, for humanity, we will get to really tap into the origin of our universe, really, as Jane said in the press conference, where we came from, what has our own galaxy been through throughout its own history? And then, you know, what has helped shape our own galaxy and by extent our own solar system and our own planet. So it's very exciting. It's not just for the scientists, it's a tool for all mankind. And we have reached the point that, yes, we made this and we are looking directly to the beginning of the universe. So very exciting. Uh, let's see. The... Uh... Okay, so of course, when, the moment I say that we are going to, thank you, Aaron, by the way, <laughs> it was very nice. Of course, the moment I say, hey, we're going to be wrapping this out, let's take one more super chat question just because, hey, you know, we want to we want to acknowledge those as best as we can. And I also want to say thank you to Ted P and also don't mean to block anybody. Uh, let's see, Webb is traveling super fast, like 2,000 miles a second at that speed. Webb is not experiencing any wind, correct? Because of the vacuum of space, like sitting still in a quiet room. Ooh, actually, no, it is, in fact. Well, it's not traveling quite that fast. It's actually going to be, it's slowing down, right? But it still is feeling the solar wind, yes? Yeah. So it's a combination of yeah. the solar winds giving it a little tiny push, right? Mm -hmm. But also, yes, we talked very early on in this chat that gravity is pulling it back. So um, so I guess kudos to those people who did the calculation for how fast we have to launch JWST and what trajectory do we put it in. But really, we're balancing this, and JWST is being slowed down. Yeah. So if you notice that for the first few days, it's really going really fast. But um, as we go into the next two weeks, it will slow down even more. So we're actually about 70% uh, in terms of distance uh, are done in the trajectory. We're very close to L2 now, but also as JWST slow down, it will take 
the rest of the two weeks, another two weeks to get to the actual L2, and then they would do the right. insertion burn. So um, it, the telescope itself is slowing down uh, in the meantime as well. Well, thank you, Aaron. And Aaron, I know you gave your, your thoughts on this, but uh, Bert, uh, we'll come to you. Just any final, any final thoughts or uh, parting, uh, parting feelings about all this today? Um, well, first of all, I did look up the MIRI detectors are cooled to 6.2 degrees Kelvin, but they do have micro Kelvin stability. <laughs> there you go. And um, uh, the, um, uh, yeah, it's just been such a great day. We've been waiting for this, uh, getting the launch locks um, on the mirrors, a uh, secondary mirror and the primary mirror wings um, done. <sighs> uh, <laughs> just, you know, looking so forward to Still forward to the uh, wavefront alignment of the mirrors. Um, you know, Lee Feinberg was on the uh, press presser just before he you know, he leads the telescope optics teams, and uh, and uh, I have total faith in in that group of people. Uh, they really really know what they're doing. That's fantastic. And Patty, how about you? To me, it's you know I'm very optimistic that this is one of those before and after moments. You know, like I can remember before the Hubble Space Telescope was in orbit and, you know, we were getting ready for that and we didn't know what we were going to find. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's actually no um, exaggeration to say that Hubble has rewritten textbooks, particularly in astronomy. You know, we've discovered things that we couldn't have imagined when it was launched. So there, And now, today, there are people that don't know the world before Hubble. Right? We're in the after Hubble world now. So I think the <laughs> same thing is true here. We have been, all astronomers, if we worked on the mission or not, we have been really focused on this moment of getting through launch, commission, you know, de deployment. This was going to be hard, and we all knew it was going to be hard, and that everything yeah. had to work right. And I feel like this is the before and after moment now. We've got this fully deployed telescope observatory. We're waiting for those instruments to turn on now. We know they're going to make transformational observations akin to that Hubble deep field, which is just the gift that keeps giving, you know, for decades from yeah. Hubble. Really looking forward to this after JWST era, right? And we're in the JWST era, and this will be that before and after moment that we'll all remember, I think. So can, couldn't be more excited. I think I think we have a, a I, I think we couldn't, I think we have to end it there. It's just a, it's just a wonderful note to end it on. And, and thank you very much uh very kind of you to say prodigy and uh yeah i really do want to thank uh these wonderful people here for joining us today. i want to thank all of you uh for joining us today and uh, you know guys uh we did it they did it well they did it you know we the humanity did it i guess but you know they did it and uh i would just again just a quick thanks to my guests Thank you all for coming in today. There's more videos coming on the way, uh, not just about James Webb, but actually about like, oh, I don't know, like other stuff. And yes, I'll be keeping you updated. I think we're going to have to bring these folks back on to talk some more about it. So thank you all so much for coming in today. It was wonderful to have you all. And as always, stay curious, my friends. I'll see you soon. <laughs>